Okay, we, uh, welcome everybody. So we are going to start uh, this morning session with uh, Jo Sturm from Bonn, please. Yeah, good morning, everybody. Uh, it's my great pleasure to be here in Pisa once again and to continue with this, uh, or be part of a continu continuation of this impressive and successful series on conferences on optimal transport. It's really a quite enthusiastic community and a uh, beautiful topic in, uh, which brings us together. My talk today is only partly related to optimal transport. You could regard this as a contribution to RCD spaces and they are of course related to the Lagrangian picture uh, or in the Lagrangian picture to optimal transport. But at the end, it's mostly uh, analysis, calculation, back, uh, one in principle could do this in the Barclay-Amir framework, uh, besides some um, uh, regularity issues which are easier to, to handle in RCD spaces. Yeah, what I want to, uh, to present today is a, a new contribution to Lichnauer's inequality. Uh, which, which in some sense is one of the most fundamental relations between analysis and geometry. It's a lower estimate for the spectral gap on a compact manifold uh, in terms of a lower bound of a Ritchie curvature. So, uh, 70 year old, uh, 60 year old uh, result. Um, and when I told to some of the young colleagues here, or actually, they are not really young anymore, but younger than me. Uh, how, that I, I present an improvement, the question was, how can you improve that? Because it's sharp for the sphere. But okay, it's sharp if a, const, if a Ritchie curvature is constant, and the, the improvement will be if a Ritchie curvature is not constant. Um, the Lichnowitz inequality, as mentioned, uh, was proven uh, in 58. There is an extension to the Barclay Emery setting by Barclay and Emery in 82, and to the uh, Curvature dimension setting by Lott and Villani in their second paper. Uh, what motivated me to start into this business was a result which impressed me very much 10 years ago by Vizier, who uh, provided an estimate for the spectral gap in terms of a harmonic mean instead of an infimum. Yeah, think of a non negatively curved manifold with Ritchie curvature point wise bounded from below by K. And instead of saying uh, lambda one is larger than the infimum, it's larger than the harmonic mean. And this, for instance, also implies to certain cases where the infimum is zero, where you would not have any information uh, otherwise. Vizier himself was uh, a little bit unsatisfied, as far as I can, can uh, interpret from his uh, publication, that he could not, could not uh, have this factor n divided by n minus one here in front. So his result is not an improvement of, uh, of Lichnowitz inequality. It's just an alternative lower bound for the spectral gap. And uh, let me phrase now the challenge in a little bit more general setting. So what we will discuss are RCD spaces. So it's, we have a metric measure space with uh, non-negative Ritchie curvature and finite dimension. And in addition, we have a function K uh, which gives a non-negative function, which gives us a pointwise lower bound for the Ritchie curvature. And this we formulate in terms of a, of a, Barclay, uh, of a Bochner inequality. So we define the gamma two operator as we usually do by the commutation of Laplacian gradient. And the assumption is that gamma two is larger than K times grad F square plus one over N Laplacian F square. This is just uh, Barclay Emery's formulation of uh, curvature bounded from below by k, variable k, and constant dimension n. You also could formulate this in a uh, Lagrangian picture, uh, fair equivalent if k is continuous at least. Uh, uh, and, but what we use is exclusively this, this uh, Bochner form. Uh, one example, this was already mentioned in one of the previous talks, standard example here, are weighted with many manifolds. Uh, so where instead of a remaining volume, you have a weighted volume, and then this barclay emery curvature dimension condition is satisfied if and only if a uh, barclay emery tensor, which is the Ritchie plus the Hessian, 
minus uh, this three factor times the gradient v squared is bounded from below by k. And what you should have in mind is if you pass from a manifold to a weighted manifold, the gradient does not change, but the Laplacian will change. So this is uh, important. And in my calculations, I, I typically write gradient where I mean the remaining gradient if there's a manifold behind. And if I write Laplacian, this is not necessarily the Laplace Beltrami, it's the Laplacian of a metric measure space, which would be here this uh, focke planck operator, however you call that. And now to formulate uh, what we have in mind, uh, it's better to normalize the volume. We assume that the volume of our underlying space is finite. We pass to the normalized volume and uh, we also introduce the negative LP norm. This turns out to be quite useful. Negative LP norm is just the same as LP norm, just with a negative P. Uh, and uh, we have this, this order of estimates since we are on a normalized space. Uh, negative infinity norm is the essential infimum of a function, of a non-negative function. And uh, if you have uh, P's and Q's uh, in this order, also these norms are ordered. So uh, we, we can rephrase now Lichnorowitz as saying that the lambda one is this prefactor times the negative infinity norm of K, of a variable which is bound, and this here is the uh, negative one norm. Harmonic mean is just the negative one norm. And now the question again uh, reformulated is, uh, can we either interpolate between these two estimates? This was one of the conjectures. Maybe you have, maybe there's a certain trade-off. If you want to have a best P here, you have a worst constant. If you have a best constant here, you have a worst P here. Maybe there is a trade-off, or maybe you can improve these things. You can have a prefactor even in this, this year estimate or whatever. Uh, so in other words, uh, the name of a game is find the maximal prefactor and the minimal P in order that you have this uh, negative LP estimate for the spectral gap. Um, and the claim is, or the main result is that indeed, it's not a, a interpolation between these two estimates. It's not simply uh, improving both uh, in the sense that you can have a prefactor in front. You can improve even further by reducing this uh, p here to a number less than one. Yeah, so the main result of today's talk is uh, for every compact manifold, this is a new result, and more generally for every RCD space, uh, as, as mentioned above, with non-negative Ritchie curvature, the spectral gap is estimated by this prefactor n divided by n minus one times the negative LP norm, where P is a number less than one, given explicitly as this n minus one divided by n squared. And um, this, of course, extends from both the Lichnowitz and the VC estimate, since uh, the estimate is better if you have a smaller P. So this is than the smallest P which you can have. And uh, let me provide you a simple example where you see this power of uh, such estimates. Of course, if you have a round sphere, you know that the spectral gap is, is just uh, uh, given by this formula of Lichnowitz. There is an identity, but if you make a conformal transformation of a round sphere, so uh, think that your round sphere, your favorite, a uh, Halloween ball is now deformed. So you deform it a little bit, you make it a little bit uh, more flat at south and north pole, and instead you, you add more curvature at the equator. Uh, this is exactly what we do here. We give a conformal weight to the metric tensor, each of a cosine square from, the, from this, this is set here. And then a simple calculation shows you that the Ricci curvature is a sine squared. So it oscillates between one and three half. Uh, it's flat at the north and south pole, but at the equator it's three half. And of course, no Lichnowitz inequality would give you anything. Yeah, because for infimum zero, you would get that spectral gap is larger than or equal zero. This is what you know anyway. And uh, what is also nice with this example indeed, and indeed this is the only example which I calculated uh, ever, is that this function here, 
uh, this is essentially one over z square around the uh, North Pole, let's say. This is not integrable. The inverse is not integrable. But it's an L negative P for every P less than one. So this Zs criterion even would not apply to that. It would again give that lambda one is greater or equal zero. But uh, the negative P norm with P less than one makes uh, the inverse of this uh, integrable and you, we have an explicit quantitative estimate. Actually, last night I had the idea that I really should calculate that uh, it, it might be that it provides the exact value, indeed. I'm not sure, I did not make the calculation. But I would not see right now where something gets lost in, in this example. And of course, you can produce many other examples. Even if the infimum of the curvature is not zero, if it oscillates, it's clear that this estimate provides you a better result than just taking the infimum. Uh, okay, now this is now the main result uh, of today. And what I want to, to provide you is more or less a complete proof for this result. Uh, this, uh, result is based on two other results which are of, of major independent interest and uh, I will also tell you a little bit on, on this. Things of a main ingredient and which made me to start working on this project was uh, an estimate which I call uh, Caron Rose estimate. I found this in a recent paper of, of uh, Jill Caron and Christian Rose um, fair proof only works in the Riemannian setting. It already breaks down if you have weighted manifolds. Uh, but it's an impressive result, which says that the spectral gap can be bounded from below by the spectral bound of a certain Schrödinger operator. And if n is infinity, the Schrödinger operator is just uh, the negative Laplacian plus the, plus the Ricci bound as a potential. Uh, this was known. Well, this is... This is uh, also in physics literature and so on, uh, quite, quite known. And it's related to the switching between semi group on one forms and semi group on functions. But now with a dimension, uh, it was really absolutely surprising to me that this factor enters twice. I first thought, okay, they made some mistake and so on. Let's be uh, very careful and, and, and check every single step in their calculation. In the calculation, Okay, I would say it's a little bit, or it's, it's more complicated than the calculation which I present you now on an abstract level. Uh, it took me quite some time to, to understand what they do. Um, but the prefactor appears twice, and, and the fact that this is in front of a K, this gives us this exponent, uh, this prefactor, and this uh, prefactor squared in front of a Laplacian gives us, a, a, at the end of the day, that we can go to a norm uh, less than one. This, uh, Caron Rose estimate, in fair case, it's, it's uh, based on a, on a refined Carter inequality, which, however, does not apply in general cases. We don't, at least I don't know of any replacement for weighted manifolds, and in particular not for RCD spaces. So I uh, found another way to deduce that uh, coming from the uh, Baku Emmy estimate, and for this Baku Emmy estimate, uh, one needs a refined or a self-improved version, which says, so this three terms here, this is the definition of uh, Bakuemi, curvature dimension condition. And the self-improvement says, if you have this inequality, you always can add this square. And this square, without the dimension, it's well known. This is just the Hessian. Uh, this is what, what we know. The uh, Bakuemi estimate implies the sharpened version where the Hessian shows up, and now with a dimension, it's again a prefactor n divided by n minus one, and if you are on a non-weighted manifold, this is when the, it's just the trace-free Hessian. And you might know that if you have a trace-free matrix, there is, a, there is an estimate between operator norm and, and Tibble schmidt norm, which provides you this factor n divided by n minus one. This naive argumentation works for uh, manifolds without weights. For manifolds with weights, it's a little bit more complicated. But actually, okay, this is, this is not complicated. This is more or less already available. Uh, we only had been too lazy to, to put things together. 
So uh, let me start with this last result for self-improved Buckley-Emery estimate. And as I mentioned, uh, there are two ingredients which had been already available. So I had written up this formula already uh, several years ago uh, in a formulation based on uh, gamma calculus without taking care of, of all this uh, approximation procedure and so on. And Giuseppe Savary has uh, a very uh, helpful paper where he did this in the dimension independent case. And in Zavar's paper, he took care of a regularization and domains and uh, test functions and so forth. And uh, in, in, in my previous paper, uh, this formula already appears, so you only have to put these things together. So uh, it seems that four years ago, I was just too lazy to, to put these things together. Uh, now I had a second look on that, and uh, it's, it's not really any new insight which is needed. Um, let me say that uh, the self-improvement in the dimension independent case goes back to, to Bakri, and uh, then, as, as mentioned, uh, in the RCD setting, uh, was proven by uh, Giuseppe. The self-improvement in the dimension dependent case uh, was first uh, proposed by Bakri and Kian. But what they did was they have this formula only for f equal g equal h. Now you think of a Hessian and you multiply it from the left and from the right by the same function which is used for the Hessian. This is good for some purposes, but, but this is not strong enough for what we need. We need really that, that we have a Hessian as an operator. So we have to choose a g and h independent. Um, and as I mentioned, I already did these calculations, but not in the sense of, of uh, of uh, curvature dimension inequality. And the answer is very easy. So if you, if you know the Barclay-Emery condition, uh, then you apply it instead of f to a new function f tilde. And if you are a little bit, um, let's say, if you allow me to argue a little bit naive, you fix a point, and at the given point, you, instead of f, you plug in f plus t times fifth functions. And at the given point, this has the same gradient. Yeah, so it has the same Ricci and so on, but you have this kind of quadratic function here. And now if you plug this into the definition of a Laplacian and of a gamma operator, everything can be made explicit. So you have a Hessian, you have uh, several terms here, and you have a gamma two inequality for this F tilde. And then you choose the optimal T and you end up with this inequality. That's it. And how to get rid of this problem that you cannot evaluate these things at a given point, this was already indicated by Giuseppe. Yeah, I can, can tell you how, uh, what you have to do. Instead of putting here g of x, you have to put here a, re a rational number r, and here you put a rational number s, and then you prove it for all r and s. You have exceptional set, but you, since you have uh, rational numbers, you can unify all these exceptional sets, and then by continuity, you extend it to all real numbers, and then a posteriori, you can replace these real numbers by the given uh, g of x and h of x. But from a geometric point of view, it's, it's more intuitive to think of this. You have a certain function, you are sitting at a point, your vector still points in this direction, but you change the vector field in, with second order terms. And these second order terms have the same Ricci, of course, but they will lead to different Laplacian and gamma two operators. And this allows to, to run this self-improvement machinery. Yeah, but as I mentioned, just combine what, what Giuseppe has done to, to argue why we can make this point-wise calculations, why this gamma operator, which is just a distributional operator, allows for point-wise evaluation and so forth, is more or less the same game. Nothing new enters. Uh, so we have this uh, gamma two estimate. Actually, we don't need in, it in this full generality. And then let's say you combine this denominator then you have a gamma g times gamma h. This complicated form is only interesting if you finally want to go to conformal transformation, but it's not uh, necessary here. You can combine that in another inequality, then you have an n divided by n minus one, coming from the sum of these two guys here. Uh, you vary in g and h, then you can produce your operator norm, and um, then Actually, we apply this only to the cases where f is harmonic. Yeah? From the very beginning, we could aim for a more simplified estimate. 
If f is harmonic, fist term drops out, fist term drops out, and we end up with, with this guy here. So now you see the improvement with a dimension. Without dimension, all of these people in RCV business know this estimate. And now with a dimension, we have an improvement, n divided by n minus 1. And this is crucial. And we can rewrite this instead of having the Laplacian of Brad f square, we can look on the Laplacian of Brad f to some power. And this is now this estimate. We have a Laplacian of a Brad f to the power n minus 2 divided by n minus 1. And the same function is then multiplied by k. So just rewriting this, we already get this uh, Schrodinger operator applied to Brad f to a power less than 1. And if you think of passing to infinite dimension, this prefactor is one, this exponent is one, so you would see the uh, self-improved Bochner inequality would give you this estimate Laplacian minus k of modulus of f to the power one is non-negative. The original Baku emery would give you this estimate with a power two here. Uh, you start with squares, this is the original Baku emery the self-improvement is power one, and the dimensional improvement is a power less than one, here in this exponent, and also here an improvement of a factor. Uh, so this estimate I found, uh, it's hidden as a lemma somewhere, regarded as very in, unimportant, uh, for many faults without weights in a paper by Boer and Caron, uh, but again, the proof would not, would not work if you plug in weights. But it's, I think for people working in, in uh, CD spaces, it's very nice to see that you can do this uh, just starting with a Baku memory without uh, using any, any sophisticated uh, estimates from Riemannian geometry. And, <clears throat> okay, so this was, uh, this was now uh, the estimate which we, which we wanted to derive. And now we want to go to this uh, Caron Rose estimate, which uh, estimates the spectral gap in terms of a spectral bound for a given Schrodinger operator. So let us start to consider any eigenfunction on uh, our, our manifold or on our comp compact metric measure space. And now this has, brings in a, a number of, of funny uh, transformations. So first of all, we rescale the distance of our uh, metric measure space, so we replace the distance by a new distance d prime, which is the old one by multiplied by uh, prefactor squared of lambda n divided by n. Yeah, in some sense, we would like to have that, first, that we anyway know that the spectral gap is, is n. This would be for our sphere, but this we do not know. So we scale it, then we have, I, the, the prime always then refers to the quantities uh, with the rescaled things. This makes now uh, that the same u is an eigenfunction for the eigenvalue n. This is just a simple calculation because the Laplacian uh, is, is modified by the square of its prefactor. And then we go to the cone. You know, we have this space and we make a metric cone over it and uh, we define a function depending on, on radius and uh, spatial coordinates, uh, r times u. And if the original function is an eigenfunction with eigenvalue n, on the cone, this new function is harmonic. And we could have applied our previous results also with a Laplacian insight. And you can believe me, I have used uh, many pages of paper to, to go on with this argument, but this did not lead to a result. Uh, so it's better to get rid of a Laplacian or of a, of a eigenvalue, uh, and this can be achieved by going to the cone. So, and now we go one dimension higher. Unfortunately, we know that in all this RCD space, this uh, Baku Emery uh, carries over from the underlying space to the cone and vice versa. This is the work of Christian Ketterer, which gives us very precise formula how this uh, uh, synthetic rigid curvature bounds transfer. So we go to the cone and we apply this generalized poor Caron estimate, which applies to harmonic functions now to the harmonic function on the cone. On the cone, okay, we have one dimension more, now it's n divided by n minus one. Before it was n minus one divided by n minus two, and so on. And uh, then we have uh, 
new Richard curvature, the new Richard curvature is the old one. The old one is on the rescale space. Now, this means it's n divided by lambda times k minus n minus one. This comes from the cone construction. Yeah? So it's the old Richard curvature minus n minus one. And it's rescaled by one over r squared. The gradient v squared in this cone is indeed a function which is independent of a radius. So this is one of the consequences that we have uh, done this uh, construction in a, in a more or less optimal way. So we have a function which does not depend on the radius. The Laplacian and the curvature depend on, on the factor of one over r squared. Actually, the Laplacian is one over r squared times the Laplacian of underlying space. Yeah, there is no radial dependence of this function. So we can replace this Laplacian of the, of the cone by the Laplacian of underlying space. And um, okay, so we end up with, with this construction. Ah, yeah, and, and the Laplacian of the underlying space is the three scale Laplacian. So there is another factor n divided by lambda. And multiply everything by negative lambda divided by n minus one, and just reorganize this to, to get the opposite sign, you will see that this is just uh, this inequality. And you see here the Schrodinger operator with another prefactor, here the eigenvalue. And now if you make the simple Rayleigh-Ritz quotient, you see that this proves that the lambda, which is here, is larger than the spectral bound of this guy is here. Uh, the spectral bound of this is uh, bounded from above by lambda. That's it. Uh, what we are interested in is, of course, the low estimate for the, for the lambda. Lambda was any eigenvalue, and in particular, it applies to the fan to the spectral gap. Any eigen, eigenvalue for a non constant eigenfunction. So you could put in here now the lambda one, and you have this uh, Caron Rose estimate. I was very impressed by that, yeah, I must say. Uh, I, I, I didn't trust that this factor appears twice. And there, I, I would guess that there are a number of further applications which are not really, uh, which did not make really use of this so far. So I think, yeah, and in the remaining case, without waste, it appears in a paper of Kahn and Rose as a proposition 3.7. And they have a number of theorems in this paper, but this is not a theorem in their paper. I think they also underestimated the power of this estimate. Okay, now let's go on. And uh, now we come to the, to, to the core of, of today's talk. Uh, we want to estimate the spectral gap estimate. And uh, for this, I introduce a number of abbreviations. So alpha will be this number, n divided by n minus one. Lambda naught should be the spectral bound for this Schrödinger operator, uh, which is negative alpha square lambda, uh, negative uh, alpha square times Laplacian plus alpha times k. And lambda one is the spectral gap of a, of a Laplacian. I choose f to be uh, the ground state for the Schrödinger operator. I normalize it uh, to one in L2. And actually, I always assume that my underlying space has normalized volume. This I can do, this would not change anything, but just to avoid any misunderstanding later. Yeah, so I have this Schrodinger operator, I choose uh, F such that I have an uh, eigenfunction. If you do not believe that there is an eigenfunction, indeed there isn't, but you also could, could work with a Rayleigh risk quotient, then you have a plus epsilon and this also would be okay. So Karen Rose tells us that lambda one is larger than capital lambda zero. So this is spectral gap of a Laplacian is bounded from below by the spectral bound of a Schrodinger operator. Now spectral bound of a Schrodinger operator is given by this formula. If f is the ground state, you can add here integral f squared. Now then you see just the definition of a ground state, uh, but integral f squared is one. So this is our definition of a Schrodinger ground state. Now we have a first, uh, remarkable estimate, we estimate this integral f squared k from below by a uh, q norm with a q less than one. You have always think that p is less than one. Parts of this calculation are true for any p, but, but think that p is between zero and one. 
then, then this number is a number between zero and one again. And we estimate this by a kind of reverse uh, Hölder inequality. And uh, if you do not trust this reverse Hölder inequality, just go in the traditional way, start with this function with uh, some power, write it as a function times the k to some power, the k to some negative power, and make traditional Hölder inequality. Then you see you can end up with f squared k and k to the minus p. And this is then uh, reformulated the lower estimate for the f squared k. So this is how we bring into the game the, the lower bound for the Ricci curvature and how we produce a negative p norm uh, for that. Now we have a f a lp norm or lq norm of f with a q less than one. So I summarize where we are. We are here now. And now we go on. And uh, the first step is we want to apply a kind of reverse Jensen inequality. Yeah, we have a Q norm with Q less than one, and we want it estimate from below by the one norm. From above, it would be Jensen, just because we are not probably this big. And uh, this from below, again, follows from this uh, Hölder inequality. We have a F, the one norm, the two norm, and here a Q norm with a Q less than one. The two norm is uh, normalized to be one, so it does not show up in the calculation, and this tells us we can estimate the Q norm from below by the one norm. So we can pass from the Q norm to the one norm. Okay, why is this better? Okay, the one norm shows up in another characterization of the spectral gap. So uh, we have used one characterization in, in the previous proof, uh, namely that it's the smallest eigenvalue, and now here it's the Poincaré inequality which we use. So uh, using the Poincaré inequality here means that the lambda one shows up again. We can estimate the one norm of f, if you put it on the left hand side, uh, from below by the two norm minus the two norm of a gradient. So we replace the one norm of f by the two norm, which is one, minus the two norm of a gradient. Okay, then you can ask uh, what is now the improvement? Now I have two lambda ones here in the formula. Does not seem uh, easier. Okay, indeed this does not very, look very, very nice. What is the next step? The next step is we bring this guy here to the left side. We put a lambda one in front of a bracket, then we have here again alpha square divided by lambda one times this gradient square, which looks very similar to this. So this means we end up with this estimate here. Yeah. This guy comes from bringing this to the left-hand side, putting lambda one in front of a bracket and dividing everything by C. This gives us this inequality. There is one warning, one has to check that this is non-negative, but indeed this follows from the very first inequality here, The non-negativity is guaranteed since it's bounded from below by alpha times f square k, and k is non-negative. So this guy is non-negative, so it does not change the inequality here. So we have this inequality. And now there comes the final uh, S, uh, basic estimate which we use, Bernoulli inequality, which tells us that we can estimate this guy from below by putting this exponent, uh, making this exponent into a prefactor here. So we have a one over p times this and uh, alpha squared times this. And if one over p is less than alpha squared, this is larger than one. And this is the regime where we want to be because alpha is uh, n divided by n minus one, so p is larger than this n minus one divided by n squared. Actually, you can choose equality, but uh, here it's needed that it's larger. And then we can estimate this from below by one. And what we obtain is that lambda one is larger than c. c was this uh, prefactor times the uh, negative LP norm, and we are done. So this is the complete self-contained proof. It's not completely trivial, but each step is, is easy. Uh, as I mentioned, there are about 100 pages which I have thrown away, uh, which I did not want to show you, which did not lead to the result. Uh, this is the 
summary of, uh, of his uh, argumentation. And uh, what we end up now is uh, this result, which I wanted to, to tell you. So the new version of Lichtenhorowitz, for self or for the improved version of Lichtenhorowitz is that lambda one can be bounded by the negative LP norm of a Ricci bound with P being uh, this factor one minus one over N squared, which always is less than one. And in addition, we have this prefactor N divided by N minus one. And uh, yeah, this is what I wanted to show you. And as I mentioned, there are plenty of nice examples, but have this in mind. And probably there will be also other applications. Uh, I also would like to invite people now to think of, of uh, similar applications. Maybe there is also a new way to attack uh, Bonnie Myers or compactness or, uh, of, of, uh, of a space is just using a little bit more non-traditional formulations of, of lower rich bounds. Okay, thanks for your attention. Okay, thank you very much. So, we have plenty of time for questions now. Ah, okay. Ah. Thanks for this beautiful talk. Um, do you expect any rigidity when the inequalities when the equalities achieved in the inequality? This is a good question. Uh, I have not really a good idea how this could look like. Yeah. Because, okay, in, in the classical case, you say rigidity, you have a K, and then you say, okay, if an object which corresponds to equality is, is the sphere. But now you have a K of X. The K of X depends on, on the space. Maybe you can expect something if you have a K of R or things like that. Um, apart from the sphere, do you have any example where the equality is achieved? So some kind of model space that one can think? Apart from the round sphere where everything is constant? I did not make calculations. As I mentioned, I, I, I just had this, this naive uh, guess that in this two dimension case, um, there are not so many additional parameters. So I think in the two dimension case, it should be equality. Yeah? Because, um, okay, we, we already use all the information to, to optimize that. But, um, no, I can't, can't tell you. I did not make further calculations. Thank you. Okay, just, just a quick question about uh, n. If, you, if n goes to infinity, you, you obtain the, the minus one norm? Yeah. Then, then, then it's just this year's result. Yeah, but could you somehow improve to some negative uh, or rich norm? I mean, it gets I mean, getting something out uh, maybe from the fact that P also goes to one uh, in some way. Or have uh, you I I did not really get what, what you meant. Uh, I mean, when N goes to infinity, yeah. you, you really get a lambda one larger than a negative, uh, the, the L, L minus one norm. This yeah. is this year's result, yes. yes this this result. would be part, but actually this, this calculation would yes. also apply to N equal infinity. But without I mean, but other inequalities, uh, for example, Sobolev inequalities, you may get some logarithmic Sobolev Ah, okay, I okay. Here, you, there's room for improvement in that. Uh, Indeed, there might be some, some chance. I did not check on that, yeah. You are right. Uh, instead of just putting in n equal infinity, you could either in the final result or in the way to the final result uh, have a precise look on, on the asymptotic, yes. Any uh, other questions? Well, uh, I have a question. So uh, this uh, mechanism of self-improvement, you think it's over or you could improve again a little bit more the, this back theory inequality or it's a never ending story? Or? <laughs> yeah, I was, I was quite surprised uh, of, of a power indeed. Uh, and yeah, let's say, in this, in this uh, approach by uh, Gilles Caron, for instance, they used a kind of self-improvement of, of Carter inequality. Uh, this is a different approach. Uh, actually, it's not a self-improvement. It's just a refined uh, estimate. Um, okay, what I hoped for many years was that also in the Lagrangian picture, 
we would have a kind of self-improvement without going into these dirty details of uh, disintegration and localization, uh, where Fabio uh, spent um, almost all of his life. Um, I, I was always hoping that in the Lagrangian picture, just thinking that the transport map is in some sense the object which, which enters the Baku Emery. And if there is a parallelism, there should be something which says if you have a transport map, which uh, provides you the curvature dimension in the sense of, of Lotte Lani Sturm, uh, would, without too much pain, give you a better estimate. But this I was not able, and, and so far no such a simple proof existed where you say, okay, I make some variation of a transport map, and then I have a better result. So maybe for the next edition of the, of the workshop. Well, I tried, I tried it since 10 years. Yeah, maybe we have to wait a little bit more editions. Okay, so more comments or questions? Uh, no? Okay, so thank you very much. Okay. We start uh, slightly uh, <coughs> before the time, a uh, couple of minutes before the time. With, uh, Andrea Mondino from uh, Oxford. Yeah, thanks, Jan, for the introduction. Many thanks to the organizers for the kind of invitation. It's great to be uh, back to Pisa. Today, I would like to uh, talk about the time like Ricci bounds uh, and uh, Einstein theory of, uh, of uh, gravity in a non smooth setting. So, and this is, and uh, tools are, are going to come from optimal transport. So, uh, broadly, say the aim of, of the talk is to present some synthetic uh, rich bounds for Lorentzian spaces with low regularity. And uh, these lower bounds are, are going to be formulated in the language of optimal transport. And uh, I will present uh, some, some applications, but uh, Fabio in the, in the next talk will present uh, uh, more applications. So, I will start with some uh, motivation from the general setting, and then I will give some basics about um, optimal transport in the Lorentzian synthetic setting, um, and then we'll talk about synthetic curvature bounds. So what we present is joint work with the Fabio Cavalletti. So the first one is the, is, uh, the, the original paper, and then we wrote this, this year a survey uh, where we condense uh, a bit things, uh, we cut proofs. Uh, so if you want to have an idea of what is done with less details, uh, I think it's a, it's a good place to start. Okay, so what is the goal of the talk? So as you know, uh, this is, uh, uh, most of you know it, so optimal transport uh, revealed to be a very effective tool to study spaces with very low regularity in the Riemannian signature, so for metric spaces, metric measure spaces. So more precisely, one can use optimal transport to uh, define and study metric measure spaces with the rigid curvature bounded from below and the mentioned bounded from above in a synthetic sense, and this is indeed the celebrated theory of CDK and spaces by Los Turbilen. So, motivated by the success in the metric space, in the metric case, so in the Riemannian signature, so we aim to develop uh, optimal transport tools in a low regularity Lorentzian setting, so we don't want, so, uh, instead of working in a Riemannian manifold, in the in Lorentzian manifold, and want a synthetic theory of Lorentzian spaces, and develop a theory of Lorentzian CD spaces. So the, the, the goal is to prove some geometric and functional inequalities, some singularity theorems, and give uh, some synthetic characterization of Einstein vacuum equation in a non-smooth setting, which include the Lorentzian metric with very low regularity. So the, in my talk, I will, I will uh, cover the Einstein vacuum equations, uh, and Fabio will talk about the uh, geometric function inequalities and theoretical theorems. Okay, so what, what are the overall advantages of using optimal transport tools? So apart from the specific synthetic framework and the result that we obtained so far with Fabio, we expect this optimal transport tool to be useful in a wider range of, of applications. And this why? Well, because classically, arguments, if you open a book in comparison geometry, both in the Riemannian and the Lorentzian setting, Classical arguments make heavy use of Jacobi field computations, which uh, if you open a book in uh, Lorentzian geometry, they are called ray Kanduri, ray Chaduri e equation. And these computations heavily rely on the smoothness of the metric. So they work well for C2 uh, metrics. 
And with some effort, one can lower the regularity to C11 with the approximation algorithm. So the main, the main advantage of using optimal transport is that basically it permits to carry over this kind of arguments that use uh, the, the graphical computation or Rachel Dur in the Lorentzian setting in a, in a framework of very low regularity where the classical terms are even not well defined. So if you have a metric which is uh, Lipschitz or even continuous, uh, the Ricci curvature is not well defined. So you, you, you need C2 to write down the uh, Ricci curvature, um, while optimal transport permits you to basically arrive to the same conclusion with a different, uh, with a different line of arguments. Okay. Okay, so now let me uh, give you an uh, overview of the Lorentzian synthetic framework. So um, if you know a little bit the TDK and theory, so the model spaces are Riemannian spaces or weighted Riemannian manifolds, and the non-smooth counterparts are metric measure spaces. So now we want to play the game that our smooth uh, guys are Lorentzian uh, manifold, and now we want to have a synthetic counterpart, and these are going to be Lorentzian prelang spaces. Okay, now I'm going to give you the definition of these Lorentzian prelang spaces. Okay, so the starting point uh, is the notion of causal space, which was uh, put forward by Kronheimer and Peros in 67. So a, a causal space is a triple. Okay, so X is a set. Uh, this less less is uh, a, so this less or equal, this less or equal is a preorder which means uh, it is uh, reflexive and transitive. And then this less less is a transitive uh, relation inside uh, this preorder. So what shall we think about is that uh, by uh, definition, but this is what also is motivating this definition. So we say that two points, uh, X and Y, are timeline related if X is less less than Y, and they are causally related if X is less or equal than Y. So what does it mean in, um, say, more, intuitive terms, it means that uh, you are in a space-time, so think of a space-time. So having x less or equal than y, it means that uh, you can find uh, a ray of light or a massive particle which uh, um, is at the event x and later is at the event y, while time-like means that uh, you can uh, find a massive particle uh, from, from x to y. Um, Okay, so causal admits light, uh, while time-like is only for, uh, for uh, so, sorry, let me just, just again. So x is equal to y means that uh, you allow that uh, light particle go, while uh, time-like is for massive particles. Okay, now uh, the, the definition by Kunzinger and uh, Seman is, is the counterpart of the metric metric uh, space for a Lorentzian uh, signature, and uh, is um, the following. So we consider this uh, uh, tuple, okay? So we consider a causal space, X, with, chrono with the chronological relation and causal relation. We endow it with a proper metric, and with the lower semi-continuous function, tau, from X times X to zero plus infinity. This tau is called time separation, and the uh, assumption on, uh, on tau is that it is uh, zero if x is uh, not uh, causally related with y, and it, it uh, satisfies a reverse Chamberlain quality, and it is strictly positive when x is chronological with y. Okay? So what is the <coughs> idea here is that this tau is, is telling you what is the time, what is the proper time lapsed from x to y. Okay? So if you, have a, if you have light, then the time doesn't pass, and this is because say, you are on the border of the causal cone, and if instead you are time-like, it means that you have positive time lapsed between two events. Okay, so and what is the difference with the, difference with the Riemannian uh, framework, well, with, the, the, with the, the metric setting, is that this tau satisfies the reverse triangular inequality, and uh, is zero outside uh, a cone disk. Okay, now uh, we have the notion of a causal and, and, uh, and timeline curve. So we say that a curve gamma from an interval to x is timelike if it is uh, local with respect to d, and uh, 
it is uh, that, uh, if you take two, two uh, times t1 less than t2, then gamma of t1 is chronological to gamma of uh, t2. And instead you say that gamma is causal if you have less or equal, okay? So this timely curve are basically the trajectories of, um, of, uh, of massive particles, while uh, uh, causal curves are trajectories of massive particles or light particles or, or photons, okay? Now, uh, this tau separation function is inducing a length, which is, so in the method setting, you take the soup of the broken geodesics, and this is because the distance function satisfies the channel inequality. Here you uh, satisfy a reverse channel inequality, so you take the inf of the broken geodesics, basically. So you take the inf of the partition uh, of, the, of the interval, and uh, you sum up over all the partitions, okay? Any questions? No, okay, sorry. Okay, and um, by definition, a causal curve gamma from an interval to x is said to be a geodesic if the length is equal to the time separation function of, uh, of, of, of different points. Notice that in the metric setting, uh, geodesics minimize length, while in the Lorentzian setting, and in most of this uh, Lorentzian synthetic setting, the geodesics are maximizing length, okay? So the, the game here is to maximize the time separation function, maximize the length. Okay. Now, in a in this Lorentzian setting, you can also have you have a, 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 a list of properties uh, on the on the, on the causal relation. Let me skip it, but and let me just say, let me just give you an example to have in mind where where, where everything works well. Okay. So consider a smooth. Uh, manifold M, and endow it with a metric of low regularity. So consider a Lorentzian metric G, which is a, which is just uh, continuous. Okay. Assume that uh, the manifold MG is time oriented, so meaning that you can find a, ven a never vanishing uh, time like vector. Then you can ask, then you can naturally endow M uh, with the notion of causal space, uh, just by considering the timeline curve and the, and the causal curves. But in general, uh, having just a Lorentzian metric uh, give you only a causal space, but not a Lorentzian prelength space. You need to ask that this metric G has some better properties. So this is always true if G is a Lipschitz, local Lipschitz, or if G, or it is enough to ask that G is continuous with some reasonable uh, causal structure that uh, in uh, Huschel Grant is called the uh, causal plane. Okay? Then if G is Lipschitz or is more generally C0 and the causal plane, then you can endow uh, the manifold with a structure of Lorentzian pre-length pre -length space by considering a, a, a auxiliary Riemannian uh, metric H that you can just fix uh, as a background uh, metric. And then you consider the associated uh, time-like and uh, causal uh, relation, just by considering time-like and the causal curves, and uh, your time separation function is going to be the length of the, it's going to be the, the soup of the length of curves, okay? So this, uh, so you enter, so a manifold with the uh, Lipschitz metric, Lipschitz Lorentzian metric enters into the framework of Lorentzian spaces, and if in addition the metric G is globally hyperbolic, meaning that uh, the causal diamonds are uh, compact, so this means that you take that for any two couple of points, uh, which are uh, one in uh, the second point is in the future of the of the first point. You take the future of the first point, you intersect with the past of the first point, and you want this to be compact. In this case, so this is by definition global hyperbolicity. Then the associated frame length space is all nice properties that you that you uh, would like uh, in this uh, uh, framework. Okay. And this global hyperbolicity is really the sta a standard assumption in uh, general activity uh, because it's uh, connected to the well poseness of the Einstein equations. So it's, it's as long as so you have it, yeah, it's, it's, um, connected to the how uh, the, um, to the solute to the hyperbolic uh, evolution by Einstein equations. Okay, so this is uh, the example to have in mind. So everything that I would, that, that I would say will work for smooth manifold, M, a endowed with a Lipschitz metric, which is globally hyperbolic, but it holds more, more in general. Okay, 
Now, let's do optimal transport in this uh, uh, setting, okay? So when we do classical optimal transport, uh, we, we take two measures, mu and nu. We consider all the plants from uh, plants, which means a, a probability measure in the product x times x, such that uh, the push forward on the first coordinate is mu and the push forward on the, on the, on, on the second coordinate is nu, okay? Now, since we are doing uh, things in uh, Lorentzian setting and we have in mind general relativity, so we want uh, the transport to be compatible with the, the uh, general relativity, so with the relativity. So we do not want uh, um, uh, transport curves to uh, travel at a higher speed than, than the speed of light. This means that we, that we want to allow only transports which are compatible with the causal relation, which means that we want to consider only those plants which are concentrated on the causal relation. Or we may want to consider only those plants which are concentrated on the chronological relation, which is more stringent. So here we allow uh, light rays. Here we allow. We, here we do not. We, here we do not allow light rays. Okay. So with this with this uh, notation, we can uh, recall the, the definition of uh, P Lorentz vast and distance, which was uh, proposed by Exter and Eckstein and, and uh, Miller, which is the following. Recall that uh, when uh, you want to speak of um, geodesics, you maximize the time separation function. So now in the optimal transport business, we, we, we are going to maximize uh, the, the cost instead of minimizing, which is what you do in the Riemannian setting. Okay, so let's read the, the uh, definition. So we have two measures, mu and nu. We want to maximize the time separation, the, the LP norm of the time separation function with respect to plants. Now we only consider plants which are causal because we want to only allow transport which is compatible with the relativity, okay? And we consider P between zero and one. Why we want to consider this, this range of P? Because remember that the, in the, uh, that, the time, that the time separation function satisfies the reverse triangular inequality. So we would like uh, this uh, Lorentz last distance to satisfy a reverse quality and for that uh, you need this range of p. Okay, then uh, by standard arguments, by using gluing of uh, transport plants, uh, one can verify uh, indeed uh, that uh, this p lower advanced distance satisfies a reverse um, channel inequality in this range of p's. Okay, so basically you are lifting the uh, Lorentzian distance from the level of uh, the space to the space of probability measures. Okay, now in order to uh, apply classical results of optimal transport, uh, it is more convenient to consider a different cost because notice that here in this formulation, we are considering just those plants which are causal and this um, constraint of being causal is not linear, is not so nice uh, if you want to apply standard techniques. So it is better to just consider, just to slightly modify the cost, so notice that if you modify the, the cost and you set it to be minus infinity outside of the causal uh, relation, since you have a maximization problem, you are forcing your plants to be concentrated on the causal relation. And then you can equivalently write the, um, the, the soup in the previous definition using, uh, the, before we were using the time separation function, by maximizing this cost, which is minus infinity outside of the causal relation. Now, mm, if our space uh, has the nice property that I mentioned before, then this cost L to power P is upper semi-continuous, and so we can apply uh, standard techniques from optimal transport, um, which, which guarantee the existence of an optimal plan, which maximizes the cost, because we have a you have an upper semi-continuous cost if you have, uh, say, standard interability conditions, then you always have an optimal plan, okay? And this optimal plan will be causal, okay? Now, just a little bit of uh, definition. We say that uh, we denote with the p -opt, uh, chronological the set of p-optimal plans uh, which are concentrated on the chronological relation. Okay. It is quite useful to consider, 
Okay, so now um, what is the um, intuition behind? Uh, so an optimal plan, um, what is the rough idea is that it is moving, that an optimal plan pi is moving the mass at the point x, the mass mu in uh, dx, in some other optimal points, which are contained in the support of mu, and these optimal points are in the future of x. So we are we are choosing points in the in the future of x in, in, in an optimal plan. And we have just seen that the existence of an optimal plan easily follows by uh, standard uh, uh, arguments once we uh, identify the natural assumptions. Now the basic question is, uh, which are such optimal points which are chosen by x? Or, or in other words, uh, how can we detect a subset gamma in the in the causal relation such that uh, the optimal plan is concentrated on gamma. And of course, this is well known, and this is linked to some key notions in optimal transport theory, which are cyclical monotonicity and Cantor virtuality. Okay? So this you all know very well. So the, the, uh, the notion of, of uh, cyclical monotonicity is roughly as follows. So we say that a uh, subset gamma in x squared is cyclically monotone with respect to a cost if it is C optimal, if it is optimal for the cost C, with respect to perturbation at finitely many points. And the, the, the rough idea of Cantor's duality is, is, is that it gives a recipe to construct uh, such cyclically monotone sets. So how, so is this so? How can we ap apply this theory in the Lorentzian framework? Okay? So in the Riemannian setting, it is well known, it is standard, that Cantor's duality is very powerful, and indeed cyclical monotonicity is equivalent to optimality. In the Lorentzian setting, it is much more subtle in because, uh, and this is due to the fact that the cost takes the value infinity on a large set, okay? So this was studied, so the optimal transport in the, for Lorentzian cost was pioneered by uh, Jan. Then it was studied uh, by uh, Bertram Fratelli Puel, Kelsur uh, McCann, and what, uh, what is, clear is that uh, optimality implies a cyclical monotonicity, and this is not so hard because basically optimality, you are checking optimality among, say, all the possible variations, but cyclical monotonicity, you are just checking the optimality uh, on finite variations. But in general, the converse is not true, and uh, say, in these uh, papers, uh, they study the uh, fine conditions to, to, to help. Okay, so how to which are some natural conditions to allow some uh, form of Kantrovich duality, okay? So here we, I, I give a definition of, um, the, here I'm giving some sufficient uh, conditions uh, and, I, and I give them as definitions, okay? So we say that a couple of measures, mu nu, is a time like P dualizable by some plan pi. If uh, such a plan pi is the chronological plan, pi optimal from, from mu to nu, and you have some natural integrability condition uh, on mu and nu. This definition is, is non-empty. You can always find uh, such, uh, such measures mu and nu, and relaxes a, a notion uh, introduced by McCann that he calls uh, Q-separated. And uh, what is the reason from the, from the previous definition is, is that uh, this is uh, a right assumption. Like this is a possible assumption to have uh, we can talk to it, okay? So if you have a synthetic Lorentzian space and you have mu and nu, which are time like P dualizable, then we can talk to it holds. And with we can talk to it, I mean that you can, that, uh, this, okay? That the soup uh, optimal transfer problem can be written as the inf of the dual problem. What about strong counter duality? So what about the existence of optimizers in this uh, right-hand side? This is uh, uh, more subtle, and it is linked to the cyclical monotonicity, not of, of the cost L to power P, but of the cost tau to power P. And this we proved with uh, Fabio. So we proved that uh, uh, if there exists a tau P cyclical monotone plan, then you have strong counter duality. But this is, say, strong counter duality is more subtle. So this existence of uh, optimizer is more subtle, again, because of the uh, infinities that show up in uh, the cost. Okay, now a last piece of uh, definition. So we say that uh, a couple of measures is uh, strongly time-lipidualizable if it is time-lipidualizable. So if you have 
uh, an optimal plan, which is, uh, uh, which is chronological. And then basically we ask that all the optimal plans uh, are uh, chronological. So the precise uh, condition is that uh, there exists a uh, subset in the chronological set such that it is, if you have a plan which is causal, then the, it is equivalent to say that this plan is optimal and it is concentrated on this set gamma. So basically you are saying that all the uh, optimal plants are chronological. Okay, and again, this notion is uh, non empty. You can always uh, hook up such measures uh, by taking two measures which are compact support and they are quite, and the, uh, the, they, and the product of their support is uh, in the chronological set. Okay, so um, just a, so a, a quick uh, uh, recall. So we have the notion of uh, vast of p vast and distance. We have the notion of uh, pseudolizable uh, measures, which mean that uh, you can find a uh, optimal plan which is chronological. And then you have the notion of strongly causal, uh, strongly p uh, dualizable, which means that basically all the optimal plans are chronological. Okay. Then, as you can imagine, you can also lift the notion of geodesic space. So you say that uh, a curve of, of probability measures is an LP geodesic if this holds. So if the LP distance between mu s and mu t is equal to t minus s, the distance of these endpoints. So by, so by uh, constructions, these LP geodesics are always causal and future directed. So they are compatible with the uh, um, Lorentzian structure. And what is the rough idea? The picture is uh, the following. So here we have the first measure, mu zero. We have mu one in the future of uh, mu zero. We, a geodesic is a, is a curve of probability measure. So here I'm, I'm picturing the support of, uh, of mu one half and the transport is uh, taking uh, place inside the causal uh, cones and it is always directed towards the future. Okay. All right. So now we have all the uh, ingredients to give the time like Ricci lower bounds in the smooth setting using optimal transport. So here is the definition of, uh, the, of the Shannon Boltzmann entropy that already showed up several times in this, uh, in this uh, conference. So this uh, characterization in the smooth setting uh, of lower bounds were given uh, by uh, McCann and independently and slightly later by uh, myself and Sur. So the paper by McCann showed up a couple of months before and uh, uh, there are some differences uh, between uh, our approach and the one of uh, Robert. So the one of Robert is really about lower bounds and more global. My approach with uh, Stefan is more local and, is, and we looked for uh, both upper and uh, lower bounds. And here I'm giving a reformulations a reformulation uh, which is more convenient for what comes next uh, for the synthetic set. Okay, so what is uh, this characterization? So consider M uh, G, which is a globally hyperbolic space time, fix P between zero and one, then the following are e equivalent. First condition is that the Ricci curvature is bounded below by minus K G D V, for every time like V, so time like means that it is inside, it is in, in the interior of the uh, causal cone. Second condition is the optimal transport characterization is that for any couple of uh, probability measures which are in the domain of uh, the entropy, which are time like dualizable, so it means that there exists an optimal plan which is time like, there exists an LP geodesic joining them such that uh, if you consider the um, real value fu the function from 0, 1 to uh, extended reals, which takes t and gives you the entropy along this, uh, this w, uh, this uh, uh, time geodesic, where well, this function is semi-convex, since it is locally Lipschitz, and it, and it satisfies the following inequality in a distributional sense. So you have the second derivative in the usual sense. Here you have, uh, since it's local Lipschitz, uh, you can have it uh, uh, almost everywhere. And then in the right hand side, you're integrating k, you have, you have k, and then you're integrating the time separation function squared times the um, 
optimal plan, an optimal plan from uh, mu to mu. Okay? And the third condition, which is also equivalent in the mood setting, is that you check uh, such a condition only for the strongly time individualizable images. Okay? So here you are taking test as, as test mu zero and uh, mu one, which are uh, time, time individualizable measures. And in uh, three, you, you choose a subset, which is the one of, of strongly time individualizable measures. And you check the same condition. Okay? Now, uh, if you already heard about uh, the 3D condition, you do the same business here. So you realize that uh, uh, such a condition makes perfect sense in a non-smooth setting. It characterizes lower bounds in the smooth setting. And so you keep it as a definition, as a lower bound on the time like Ricci in the non-smooth setting. Okay, this is what we did with, uh, uh, with Fabio as starting point of developing a theory in the normal setting. So we say that a measure Lorentzian space satisfies the time-like curvature dimension condition, um, lower bound on the Ricci by K, upper bound on the dimension by N. Uh, this P comes from the P versus time that you are considering, and this E uh, come from entropy because we are considering the, uh, the entropic version if the condition to be four holds. Okay? So if for any couple of probability measures, which is time like individualizable, we, we can find a um, geodesic between the two such that uh, the convexity of the entropy holds. Okay? This is the TCD condition. If you only ask this condition for those measures which are strongly time individualizable, then you call this, this uh, uh, condition weak time like uh, CD condition. Okay? Uh, as, as recently shown by Brown, uh, if you assume that uh, the space is uh, time like non branching, then the time like CD and weak time like CD are equivalent. And uh, say in this formulation, we chose uh, the approach to the CD condition uh, using the uh, Shannon entropy. Uh, and this was uh, the approach uh, uh, by Herbert Quaden Sturm, where they uh, introduced the CDEKN. You can do the analogous business considering the uh, Sturm approach uh, to CDKN or Bakker and Sturm uh, CD star KN, and you will get the time like CDPKN and time like CD star PKN, if you know it. it, 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 it to be this theory, and this was done recently by Brown. Okay, so this is the definition, and now uh, say a crucial feature of the metric measure uh, setting was the stability of the CD condition. Okay, and what about uh, uh, this in the Lorentzian framework? So first of all, we need a notion of convergence. So in the metric measure setting, the notion of, 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 of convergence is pointed measure of Hausdorff. Now. Do we have something similar? Well, with Fabio, we propose a, a counterpart of it using a, the formulation of point measure of Waldorf when you embed everything in a common space. So you, you know that um, one of the formulations of point measure of Waldorf is, is that uh, you have uh, your sequence of metamature spaces, you embed them uh, isometrically in some ambient metamature space, and you ask uh, which convergence of the measures there. Here we, have the, here we have the analogous uh, condition. So we have a sequence of synthetic uh, Lorentzian spaces. We said that they converge to a limit space. If there exists an ambient Lorentzian synthetic space where they are all embedded uh, isomorphically, means that you want the embedding to uh, preserve the uh, causal structure. So you want that if two points are causally related, then the immersions, then the Immersions are also totally related. It preserves the, ta the, the time separation function and uh, it preserves also the topology. So you, you want these to, this to be topological embeddings. In the method measures of Hausdorff, you want them to be isometric. Here you need a little bit less. You just need it to preserve the topology. Where the convergence comes, you ask that the, the, that the push forward of the measure uh, with respect to these uh, immersions converge to the limit. Uh, push forward immersion weekly in duality with the uh, uh, function with, uh, with local support in the ambient space. And you ask uh, convergence of the reference points. Okay, so th this is really the, uh, the analog of the pointed measurement of Hausdorff for Lorentzian spaces. Okay, and with Fabio, we prove uh, a weak stability result. 
which is the following. So you have a, a sequence of spaces, xj, which converge to x infinity in this, in this uh, weak sense. Uh, this xj satisfy a uniform TCD condition with lower bound by k, upper bound, lower bound on the time aggregation by k, upper bound on the dimension by n. k and n are, are fixed along the uh, sequence. Then the limit space satisfies the weak version of the TCD condition. Okay? And uh, this is where, uh, where, where, where some difficulty shows up. Fabio will say uh, more about that. So the, the fact that uh, the transport here is made only along causal plants uh, is creating uh, issues. And this is where um, is why we need to, in, uh, in, the, in the limit, we get uh, only the weak TCD. And yeah, I think that this is one of the interesting features of also of the theory where uh, new difficulties uh, show up. And uh, let me just say, so Fabio will say more about, uh, about uh, say this difficulty and how we overcome it. Let me just say that uh, one of the reasons of the impact of Los Tour Milani uh, CD come from the stability. And so we expect uh, also uh, this to be uh, useful in the Laurentian setting. There is already some applications to that that Fabio will, uh, will briefly mention in, in his talk. But this was about lower bounds. Then let me uh, say something. How much time do I have? Good, okay. Now, what about uh, upper bounds? So in the Riemannian setting, uh, upper bounds on the Ricci curvature were studied by a number of people. And you mentioned neighbor and neighbor and as of a neighbor in terms of functional inequality on past spaces and, and uh, martingales. And uh, uh, was studied by Sturm and Herbert Sturm in terms of contraction, contraction or uh, expansion rate estimates on the heat flow. And in terms of displacement concavity, not that uh, Lower bounds are uh, displaced in convexity, upper bounds are displaced in concavity, but for short geodesics of the Shannon Boltzmann network. So uh, now I'm going to present uh, the Lorentzian counterpart, and this has been very much inspired by the Sturm approach. So basically, we want to implement this uh, Sturm approach using concavity of the Shannon Boltzmann entropy in the Lorentzian setting. Okay? So this, what I'm going to present now, is a joint work with uh, Sur. So this appeared uh, after the work with Fabio, and it's in, and it's in, a, in uh, an appendix of the uh, GEMS uh, of paper, which has been uh, which appeared in the Journal of the European Math Society. So definition of synthetic timely Ricci upper bounds. So keep tight. It is it's going to be a bit technical, but I'm going to tell you what is the intuition behind. Okay, so we want to define what is uh, uh, an upper bound on the time like Ricci, and upper bound is by some constant k. Okay, so what we have seen before is that lower bound means that uh, the entropy is convex. Now, upper bound, we want to say that the entropy is concave. Okay, but that's not, that's not really true. So, you need to restrict yourself to short geodesics. So, you, you, you check concavity just on short geodesics. So, th there are going to be several parameters uh, floating around. Uh, one of the parameters is this uh, R0, which is telling you how short must be the geodesic. Then you will not have exact concavity. You, will, you, will, you have to pay the price of having some error, and this omega will tell you how much error you are paying in the concavity. Okay? All right. Now I want to formalize the notion of concavity in the, uh, uh, in the TANEC uh, direction. Okay, so let's take two points, x and y. x is going to be kind of the central point of the geodesic. y is going to be the final point. We want them to be close by, so let's say that they are distance r from one to each other. And we want a small ball around x times small ball around y to be chronological, so that we have a chronological transport between them. Okay, then we take a measure mu0 which is concentrated very much along the point x. And the condition asks that there exists a geodesic, Lp, satisfying the following condition. You want the final point of the geodesic to be concentrated near the final point y. So you have x, you have the final point y. You want uh, the support of, the, of, the union, of, of all the geodesic to be still close by x. So this 10 times r means that you are still contained in a small ball around x. And then the key, say, where the condition, where really the condition is, is concavity condition of the entropy. Okay, so this 
you have to read it as a concavity condition of the entropy, k is how concave is uh, the function, entropy in time, the time t, and this omega is the error that uh, you are paying. Okay, so the, the larger the, uh, the, the, the ball, the, the, the larger the uh, error, and okay. okay. So you have these parameters floating around, but basically is, is concavity for short geodesics in the time-like direction. Okay, so this notion is uh, compatible with uh, the smooth setting. So uh, if you have a, a Lorentzian manifold with upper bound on the, on the, on the Ricci, if and only if this uh, condition holds, and the key thing is that this notion is stable under uh, the previous uh, notion of uh, convergence. Okay, so you have a, a sequence of synthetic spaces which converge to a limit synthetic space in the in the previous sense. Here you have here you need to add that uh, uh, the spaces are isometrically embedded in the in the in the uh, in the Nagen space, but it's not much. Uh, it's not a, it's a kind of natural assumption. You assume also that you have a volume non-collapsing, so you ask that uh, you have a uniform lower bound on the uh, on the measures on the volumes of the metric balls around the uh, around the points. You ask that uh, each xj satisfy the upper bound on the uh, Ricci with uniform parameters, say k, this uh, r, and this error term omega, and then the limit space satisfy also the synthetic Ricci uh, curvature. Uh, bound from up above with the same parameters, okay? So you have, uh, you have a stability result for these upper bounds as well, okay? And now let's go quickly to the Einstein vacuum e equation. So the rough idea is that uh, uh, Einstein vacuum equation can be written as uh, Ricci identically equal to some constant k, where this constant k is given by, is given by playing with the cosmological constant with this formula. Now, since Ricci is uh, a tensor, it is easy to check that uh, the Ricci is constantly equal to k just on time-like directions, even only if it is really constant equal to k everywhere. So it is enough to check uh, Ricci equal to k on the time-like uh, directions, okay? But now what we know is that we can characterize time-like Ricci bounded below by k and time-like Ricci bounded above by k in a, in a way which is compatible with uh, smooth setting and which is stable under weak convergence. And then we just do, then we just sandwich, okay? We just ask reach bound below by k, reach bound above by k, then reach must be equal to k in the time-like direction. And so you get reach equal to k everywhere uh, by this uh, easy observation in a way which is compatible with the smooth setting and which is stable under weak convergence of Lorentzian spaces, okay? So what is uh, a uh, heuristic here uh, from, from physics is that, say, the Second law of thermodynamics is about the first derivative of the entropy. So I say that uh, the entropy is always growing. While what is the outcome here is that the gravity is about a second derivative of uh, the entropy because it is uh, connected to um, convexity and concavity of the, uh, of the entropy. Okay, so then combining everything, you get a notion of Ricci equal to K by just asking the time like CD, uh, Kn, and the synthetic upper bound. This is going to be compatible with the vacuum Einstein equations and is going to be stable under this notion of uh, weak convergence of, uh, of, um, of Lorentzian synthetic spaces, uh, which is kind of Lorentzian version of the uh, pointed measurement of Hausdorff. Okay, very good. So now let me, in the last one minute, minus one minute, uh, let me just uh, uh, do a, a little uh, comparison with the, the more established uh, uh, GR literature. So in the more established uh, GR literature, the stability problem for Einstein equation is uh, usually stated in, in terms of convergence of a sequence of Lorentzian metrics under a fixed underlying manifold. Okay, you, you, have, so you have a smooth underlying manifold and you have convergence of uh, the metric tensors J, GJ. Okay, so what is well known is that uh, if uh, this GJ converge uh, uh, in C0 lock and the derivatives converge in L2 lock, then the limit G infinity satisfies also the Einstein vacuum equation. So the Einstein vacuum equation is stable under this kind of uh, functional convergence. However, if you only ask weak L2 convergence of the derivatives, 
Then it is quite interesting that uh, uh, even if you start from solution of the a vacuum Einstein equation, then the, in the limit you it may appear some non vanishing non vanishing stress energy, stress energy momentum tensor, and there are example of this phenomenon. This is a conjecture in this field, which is called the Burnett conjecture, which says that if you have a uniform convergence of the matrix, in this with, uh, with lambda j is going to zero, bounded uh, first derivatives, and uh, say the second derivative blow up in a controlled way, then the conjecture say that, uh, that uh, the limit, that, that, uh, the, non that the non zero uh, energy momentum tensor that shows up in the limit has a very precise form, it is of Blasov type, and such conjecture remain mm, quite open, and there is some recent prog progress by Luke and uh, Rodiansky under symmetry conditions. So this is so the stability problem for the Einstein equation is a hot topic in uh, in uh, GR. And what uh, uh, what are we saying to this uh, problem with uh, this kind of uh, uh, approach? Okay. So com combining the compatibility with the smooth setting and the, the stability result. What we get is that uh, the corresponding limits of smooth solutions of the Einstein equation reach equal to k, which satisfy a, the weak form of the Einstein equation uh, reach equal to k in the synthetic sense. So in other words, what we can prove is that uh, the vacuum Einstein equations are stable under the above conditions and the, with respect to the above convergence. Okay, so you, you need these uh, parameters to be uniform and uh, we have this kind of common fault of convergence. Okay, so this stability result that uh, I just mentioned give a new point of view on the stability of vacuum Einstein equations. Indeed, while the results in the say more uh, classical uh, GR literature, the matrix GJ are converging on a fixed underlying manifold, it is a smooth underlying manifold. So in our uh, approach, also the underlying space X can vary along the sequence and at the limit, allowing changes of uh, topology. So things in the in the common factor Conversion, you can have change of topology at uh, the limit. And this, I think, is interesting also for application in general relativity, where you have, for instance, changing of topology in the, in the, in the space time along some processes, like uh, two black holes which are gravitating along one to each other, and then there's a final merging of the black holes, and this is provoking a change of topology of the space time. Okay? Moreover, the notion of convergence that we use is quite different in spirit. Indeed, while the aforementioned results use that uh, GJ are converging to the limit tense to the limit matrix in a functional analytic sense, our stability theorem uh, is in the sense of a more geometric convergence, which is inspired by the uh, measured profile of convergence. Okay, so I think I'm already over time, and thank you very much for your attention. <laughs> okay, so comment or questions? For a start, thank you for the, the seminar, which was very interesting. And I, I wanted to ask if I didn't get anything wrong, uh, in a way, in order to achieve stability of the solutions of the equation, you are, you are in a way considering a family of uh, Einstein equations parameterized by what you call the error function uh, omega. Yeah. And do you think that the that stability on omega is a, a crucial geometric or, in a way, physical point or just a technical point which you hope to to avoid right so i think i'd say this thank you for this question um yeah so i think i'd say um it is not just technical because uh, by this uh, uh, slide so what we know from uh, say classical literature of gr is that uh, just asking that uh, you that you solve the einstein equation cannot give you a stability because you you may have a non-trivial energy tensor showing up in the limit so basically, this kind of uh, uh, what, what can appear as a uh, not very digestible technical conditions actually are some sufficient conditions which must be uniform. So this omega and this r, which uh, must be in order to have stability of the Einstein equation at the, the limit. And without any condition, this shows that you cannot expect uh, stability. So we are giving some sufficient conditions to have stability. Just another thing, uh, do yeah. you think that maybe in, in a 
in future you can uh, um, derive some some uh, inference on the on this stress tensor by looking at the um, error function omega which you're using to bound the the curvature do you think that the, these two functions these two notions are related or omega and what is the idea and the, idea the stress notion? tensor which may uh, this the stress energy momentum tensor which may appear in the limit if omega is not uh, uniform i think that omega is much less information so you, you think of omega as a, you are bounding something i mean you, you have some basically you have a, 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 a lot of info so basically so what's happening here is that uh, um, you have uh, oscillations at the level of uh, first derivatives uh, in these examples uh, you have weak you have weak convergence and then in the limit uh, you get something non-trivial uh, this omega is basically telling you that uh, uh, you have a bound on how this is oscillating, but it is just a bound. So you have much less information than uh, what is okay. really happening. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. So about the static problem, uh, so I, the first part of the seminar so do you have uh, are there approximation results uh, so because you have the, this cost which is minus infinity so can you uh, so, so are the results like uh, i don't know maybe also entropic regularization or uh, you you approximate with bounded functions uh, uh, which approximate uh, from below or something like that no, it's from above of course uh, where uh, you have convergence or maybe you have a gap uh, or something like that we haven't thought about that. I think it's an interesting uh, thing to look at. And uh, yeah, this is they, uh, really say, I think it's a, there is room for uh, a lot of progresses. And uh, say, if you have ideas, say, uh, say, welcome everybody. So uh, new ideas are welcome. Yeah. Thank you. You can maybe uh, have just a few questions. So sure. uh, dimen uh, dimension four doesn't play any role in this theory. No, so far, no. Yeah, are you happy about that or not? I know. <laughs> I mean, it is uh, it is good to have a general theory. It is also good when uh, uh, when when uh, when sometimes uh, you are able to pick up the physical dimensions. Uh, here, it is really general theory, uh, which has, I mean, it is the advantage that uh, say I'm talking to people in physics in string theory, and they have higher they 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 work with the higher dimension, and they are happy to to have a general theory. If you work with, if you talk with people in the GR, they are happy to work in four dimensions. So, yeah, mm -hmm. pro and cons. Okay, so thank you very much. Thank okay. you. <laughs> and uh, we have the break. And, and see. Okay, so le let's uh, start again with uh, Fabio Cavalli. Sista. Ah, yeah, yeah, so I'm ready, sorry. <laughs> yeah, okay, thanks a lot to the organizers for uh, this very nice invitation. I'm very happy <coughs> to be in PISA. So, yeah, my talk would be um, the second part of the, so it's a continuation of the one of the given by Andrea before. And um, uh, so the, 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 the plan here is to discuss a little bit, a little bit more in details the stability issues that appeared with the synthetic definition of the curvature bounds in the Lorentzian setting for, for Lorentzian equivalent spaces. So we have already seen that um, there is this subtlety appearing between the strong version of the time net curvature dimension condition and the, uh, and the weak version. Uh, and then I will discuss a little bit about uh, a few geometric uh, consequences of uh, this uh, geometric condition that would be the Hawking singularity theorem and uh, a type of grooming cost inequality that, that I will just present as a prototype of the same kind of uh, comparison type inequality that you can have that you can obtain also in this framework parallel to what you can do on uh, on the classical Riemannian setting and um, yeah so let's start uh, recalling this definition that we have uh, just seen in the previous talk so here the parameters that we that we are using are three as, as we have seen before you have the exponent p between zero and one case the lower bound Ricci curvature and the upper bound the dimension and we have uh, 
this measure Lorentz and Fuden spaces here. Again, as Andrea said, that here we can just, if you do not like that much this uh, weak formulation, you can think about as a manifold with a Lipschitz metric and with its globally hyperbolic. So, and uh, we have seen that uh, this definition of time that curve of dimension condition with parameter p in its entropic formulation, if you have that uh, uh, once that you exponentiate the entropy with respect to this reference measure along uh, this uh, Lorentzian uh, Wasserstein geodesic, uh, then the resulting function un, this one satisfies the second order bound in, a, in, the, in the distributional sense. Uh, this difference between uh, the time like curve of dimension condition and the weak one, it's uh, either because you choose to ask for this condition for any uh, couple of time like p-dualizable probability measures, so one has to be in the future of the other and the Cantorovic duality should hold, while uh, you get the weaker one, the weaker version of the time like curve of dimension condition, if you ask this condition to be valid for a uh, smaller subset of uh, probability measures, that are those measures for which you have somehow existence of solutions for the Kantorovich duality dual problem. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, so this is the condition that we have uh, introduced, taking inspiration from the work of Robert and uh, Andrea and Stefan Sur. And uh, this one, as you know, it can be can be written in a more uh, uh, friendly way if you just think about of the classical and the original definition of the CDKN condition introduced by uh, Sturm, Lott, and Villani. So if you uh, you can make a comparison, uh, you can rewrite this this distributional bound in the classical way by comparing uh, the function u n with the solution of the second order of the. For instance, in the case in the case in which k is fifty positive, you have to compare with the ratio between the sinus uh, valued and t and divided by the uh, the same sinus without the t, or just uh, in the case k equals zero, you just have t, and this one becomes a plain concavity property for the uh, exponential of minus the of minus the, the entropy. Okay, and uh, just let me also recall these two uh, notions that we have just seen. So one is the time-like p-dualizability, and uh, as we've seen, this means indeed that two couples are time-like p-dualizable if uh, we are able to find a transport plan, pi. So here I recall that this definition means that it's just concentrated on the points having a, on the couples in, a, in the causal relation. So allowing also uh, points to be on the boundary of the light cone. Mm -hmm. And uh, so if you are able to find a causal coupling that is optimal and also leaves only on the time lag relation. So just uh, neglect what happens on the boundary of the, of the, of the light cone. Mm -hmm. And you also ask for uh, some plain uh, integrability assumptions on the uh, classical integrability assumption. So these two conditions are sufficient to say that the uh, Bassett, so the Lorentzian optimal transport problem, so the, 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 the value is equal to the supreme, to the infimum of the dual Kantorovich uh, problem. So in this way, you can say that uh, Kantorovich duality holds. Uh, while if you ask for the strongly time like dualizable, as we've seen, this means somehow that uh, you can bundle together all the optimal, all the support of the uh, optimal transport plans, and they still are a subset of the time like relation. So here is this one is the time like relation. And uh, um, as people is familiar with optimal transport, this is a well known consequence of the existence of a solution of the dual Kantorovich, uh, of the dual Kantorovich problem. So we have these two families of uh, distinguished families of couples of probability measures that are somehow one in the future of the other, but somehow this one, it's uh, a bit more um, handy. And as we've already seen, I mean, these uh, both conditions are, uh, I mean, this condition here is, uh, it's non-empty. Indeed, if you take two probability measures that are sufficiently close so that, that the product of their support is contained in the, in the time-like future, so in the time-like relation, then, then you're forced to have uh, necessarily um, that any transport plan trivially has to be optimal transport plan trivially has to be concentrated indeed uh, on this uh, on this relation. Okay, so we have these uh, two different type of uh, conditions. So one with this family of time like dualizable uh, probability measure, and then we have this strongly time like dualizable couple of measures. And um, as Brad Andrea said, then in uh, under fairly as, um, general assumptions, these two conditions 
are uh, they coincide in the case in which uh, the space uh, is additionally assumed to be time-like non-branching. Okay, so this is a recent theorem by Matthias Brown. And here, time-like non-branching, what it means, it means somehow that if you take uh, a, a Lorentzian geodesics, that has to be time-like. So you just ask this condition for time-like geodesics. So they just live inside the uh, light cone. Uh, and so what happens is that you do not want them to coincide on an open interval and then to branch out, like forming a branch-like structure. So you want to avoid this kind of phenomenon. This uh, has been introduced by, as, as a notion that has been introduced in the uh, metric setting by Sturm and Rayala. And uh, it's, it's well known to imply several properties at the level of uh, Wasserstein geodesic. And here, uh, also the Lorentzian setting play no uh, exception. So under this assumption, you see that uh, the, 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 the weak version and the, and the strong version, they just coincide. And, in, and in, in, under this general assumption, you can say that uh, you can also pass from the concavity properties of the uh, of, or displacement convexity of the, of the entropy to the pointwise formulation formulated just uh, in terms of the densities of the probability measure. So if you have... Uh, uh, Lorentz and Wasserstein and geodesic uh, with uh, density root t, then you can say that, uh, so affirming that the space uh, satisfies this time-like curvature dimension condition is indeed equivalent to ask the uh, classical concavity properties for the densities along uh, the uh, Lorentz and geodesic. Mm -hmm. Okay, and um, somehow to, to avoid these this, this issues of having uh, to distinguish between uh, uh, those couples having a probability having a solution or not of the dual Kantrovich problem, we decided also to look for uh, another notion that actually is also very popular in the metric setting that has been introduced in that setting by Otten and Sturm independently, that it's uh, the measure contraction property. So here, the idea is that uh, instead of um, thinking about the general probability measure, one and the other one in the future, it just collapse the second probability measure to a Dirac delta. And uh, in that case, the, the curvature condition becomes uh, somehow a uh, weaker information, but nonetheless uh, has uh, several geometric consequences. And uh, so we gave this definition accordingly to what happens in the metric case, that it's time-like measure contraction property still with this superscript E stands for its uh, entropic version. And what you ask is that you take any mu naught probability measure with compact support uh, and uh, you pick any point x1 so that almost every point of the support of mu naught stands in the time like past of x1, or you could just say that x1 is in the future of almost every point of your probability measure mu naught, and you, and you ask for the previous uh, concavity estimate that we have seen before for the time like curvature dimension condition, but we're just neglecting the term for mu, mu1. And the condition became essentially, essentially this one. Mm -hmm. So where you have just simply dropped the second term on the right-hand side of, uh, of the inequality and become somehow here not anymore a concavity estimate but uh, somehow imposing a lower bound on how, ch how fast can decrease the, the, the entropy when you collapse to a single Dirac delta in the future of, of your measure. And uh, okay, as you can uh, imagine, this is a weaker condition than, uh, than the uh, time like curvature dimension condition, but it also has a, a nice feature that it does not depend at this point on the parameter p where we are, that it was fixed before in order to select which kind of uh, exponent, which kind of uh, uh, Wasserstein metric you want to consider. And here is simply because uh, once that you fix a, a final measure as a direct measure, so, somehow every, uh, so the only reasonable coupling to send all the mass to one point, so there is no need to distinguish between uh, different Wasserstein geodesics depending on the parameter P. And, uh, and also, Nonetheless, this, this condition here is sufficient to, to deduce uh, interesting geometric properties. Uh, and we will see that via an extension of the localization principle to this setting, we were able to obtain uh, a form of the bishop gromov inequality. So here, bishop gromov uh, in a classical uh, Riemannian context, you are comparing the volume of bolts as, you, as they increase with the radius. So now they say that uh, uh, they cannot increase too much compared to what, happened, to what happens before. Here, you cannot really have the same type of theorem because in, uh, in this setting, if you consider just a, a time-like ball, then it might have infinite volume because you have to think about an, an hyperboloid. But somehow, if you, if you can somehow restrict to domains uh, having a very nice geometry, 
then you're able to generalize the same type of uh, inequality. And in the same spirit, you're, we were also able to obtain a time-like version of the bonnet myers uh, upper bound on the diameter for uh, uh, this, type of, uh, this type of spaces. And, um, and okay, also let me mention that then we will maybe see at, at the end of the talk also that uh, how to deduce from this time-like curve to dimension condition also the Bruminkowski inequality in its sharp version. And uh, okay, so um, let me recall just uh, <coughs> the definition of convergence that we have seen before. So uh, let's say that our primary effort together with Andrea was to understand indeed if uh, this, this notion that was indeed uh, quite natural to, to generalize after the work of uh, Robert and uh, Andrea and, 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 and Stefan was to understand if this condition has the, um, has the stability property. So, as we've seen, we have defined we have defined this uh, notion of convergence in, in choosing uh, somehow to follow the idea of uh, inserting pushing all of our sequence of spaces inside a larger space where we would like to uh, somehow understand uh, how the two spaces are are close, and so we ask for uh, we say that a sequence here of um, pre of Lorentz and Prelent spaces with a distinguished fixed point. So these are pointed. Uh, measured Lorentz and Prelent spaces are converging to a limit space uh, if you ask uh, for their existence of a larger space. Uh, again, there has to be uh, locally causally closed, uh, globally hyperbolic Lorentz and, and also has to be geodesic. Uh, and you want somehow to have this, to, the, to have the existence of isomorphic, uh, of um, isomorphic embeddings of, this <coughs> of the sequence inside this large space Yota J. And here we have to agree a little bit on what it means to be isomorphically embed this sequence inside a larger space, this means that uh, somehow the causal relations or the causal structure of the space, they have to be preserved once you move inside this larger space. So this means indeed that two points are causally related in the sequence, if and only if they are causally related in the future. And also you want the time like uh, the time separation function, that, that is how this called this function tau, also have to be preserved. So somehow if, if two points are Time separated by a certain value, also their image has to have the same, uh, the same, uh, the same value. So now this is kind of the analog of having this isometric embedding of the metric uh, in the metric sense. So you put everything inside the same space, and then you ask for the convergence in the weak sense uh, of the measures uh, via the push forward with the duality with the uh, continuous and compact support functions, and with the convergence of the final point. And uh, yeah, okay. So the the uh, the one of the motivations that also, uh, one of the, the reasons why indeed we believe it is very interesting also to consider this uh, measure contraction, this time like measure contraction version is that uh, uh, somehow this, the measure contraction property here is stable without having to deal too much about the weak version of the strong version, just because you are just neglecting all of these issues with the uh, existence of solutions of the dual Kantrovich problem or not. So here the, the result is that uh, if you have a sequence of pointed measured pre uh, Lorentz and uh, prelent spaces converging to a limit one in the previous sense uh, for some uniform lower bound Ricci of the time that Ricci curvature and upper bound the dimension. And uh, uh, it satisfies this entropic version of the time like measure contraction property for each J, then also the limit space satisfies the same condition. And as Andrea already, already mentioned, while in the, for the time like curvature dimension condition here, the situation is a bit trickier and still not uh, Still uh, leave some 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 uh, some space for uh, understanding a little bit better what's going on. So, if you have the sequence that satisfies the strong time-like curvature dimension condition with parameter p, and uh, in its entropic formulation, then in the limit you can just get the weak version. So now let me discuss a little bit why there is this difference and where these uh, issues uh, is appearing. Um, okay, so what is the classical way for? Uh, uh, at least, yeah, let's, let me say that here, to, to attack this problem, we decided to follow, uh, let's say, a classical idea to, uh, that we took inspiration from the stability result of, uh, of Sturm. Uh, so the point here, what it is, it's like, you, let's say that you have a limit space hmm, for which you would like to prove uh, this concavity uh, or convexity properties of the entropy. So what you have to do, you have to fix two uh, probability measures that here I have done a bit mu not infinity and mu one infinity. 
that are both absolutely continuous with respect to the limit reference measure, this is m infinity. And the goal in order to formulate uh, proper curvature information is to construct a Lorentz and Wasserstein geodesic, an LP geodesic, mu infinity, along which the uh, exponential of minus d entropy satisfies the inequality that we have seen at the beginning. So it has this nice concavity, uh, concavity property. So the idea, uh, the classical approach would be, okay, now I have, uh, uh, I know this information for an approaching space. So we, we, we know it for this space indexed by j. So we have mj converging to m infinity in the, in the weak sense. This can be with no effort uh, upgraded to a W2 convergence with respect to this reference distance that you have fixed, but doesn't play any role. It's just, it's just a, a trick to uh, construct, uh, to consider an optimal uh, coupling between this m infinity and, and, and mj. And uh, let's say that it's the optimal plan between this, M, this, this approximating reference measure and the limit measure. And you, you want to use this uh, coupling to transfer the information from the approaching space to the limit one in some sense, okay? And this is, a, again, it's a standard thing to do. So you just uh, somehow transfer these two uh, probability measure in the limit space to a sequence of approximating probability measure that that's denoted by mu ij. So these are two probability measure living uh, on the xj space converging to the limit one. They are both absolutely continuous with respect to this uh, reference measure. This is done by using this transfer plan from m infinity to mj, and they converge nicely to this limit object. So the general scheme here that breaks down would be to say, okay, now what, I, what I, I do, I just use my curvature information on the approximating space. So here I have the existence of a geodesic along which I have uh, the, I can use my curvature information and just playing with the entropy and having these, uh, let's say, gamma limit. In fact, I can say that in the, the, at, the, at the two extremal, I have convergence of the entropy. In the middle, I use the upper semi-continuity and, uh, and basically I'm done. Unfortunately, here, the problem is that there is this uh, time-like <coughs> sorry, time -like relation that has to be uh, somehow preserved. So there is this time-like relation that says that if uh, somehow what is happening here, so the missing ingredient is that I want mu one infinity to be in the in the future of mu not infinity. So they have to be causally related. When I'm doing this trick of moving back my approximating uh, to my approximating space is to measure, then somehow the uh, time like uh, so the causal relation between these two measures is also somehow lost. And uh, so the, the 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 most efficient way to restore it uh, was somehow to impose the existence of a of a unique of a, of a big set where you can bundle together all the support of the optimal trajectory in the vast sense sense to go from one place to another one. Mm -hmm. And you can somehow imposing them that the, the, the limit one, it's a, it's a, a, fair, it's a couple that is strongly time-like pedalizable is sufficient to get that you have a time-like pedalizable approximating sequence. So it's a bit technical, but somehow it's, a, I think, not so much technical. It's also has some uh, geometric problem behind. And uh, okay, so, <clears throat> That is the major issue causing uh, the uh, appearance of this strange, uh, of this unexpected uh, um, stability property. And uh, now let me also mention a couple of uh, results that have recently used uh, these convergence properties, so the stability properties of the uh, of this convergence that we have introduced. And this is a, uh, has been presented by Matthias Brown and Calisti uh, very recently. It was like maybe two months ago, I guess. And um, somehow it links the uh, distributional approach to uh, curvature bounds to the synthetic one. So in the general relativity setting, so this, the distributional lower bounds were already present in the literature. And uh, so it was, uh, I think, um, uh, they managed, what they managed to do is to somehow prove that if you have a lower bound, so if you have a, a Lorentzian manifold with a C1 uh, metric, so G is C1, and you also consider a C1 weight on the, uh, on the measure, so you, you get a weighted Lorentzian manifold, so with this uh, weight e to the minus book. And, and if you assume this one to have weighted time like Ricci curvature bound from below by k in the distributional sense, <coughs> then they prove that uh, it satisfies indeed the time like measure contraction property with the same parameter k and n. And the idea here, here is to go by approximation. So they, they prove that if you have uh, g to be c1, then you can uh, do uh, a modification that. Uh, increase the regularity of G by worsening a little bit the lower bound, but not that much. 
once that you have the regularization, you can go to the synthetic version. Well, you will have a parameter here, let's say k minus epsilon. And then when you let the parameter of the uh, regularization go to zero, in the limit, you still you get the time like measure contraction probably with the right parameter. Hmm. And uh, assuming a little bit more of regularity, they, uh, so that G is not just C1, but uh, C11, they even managed to prove that the distribution lower bound implies the TCD, even without this entropic uh, exponent, uh, that is the version uh, considered uh, studied by uh, Matthias Brown, that it's just the possibly equivalent form of the entropic version. So let's say that the consequence of this uh, uh, stability result is that the distributional bounds fit very well with the, with the synthetic theory. And, um, and yes, okay. So this is, a, uh, now let's just pass to discuss a little bit of, uh, <coughs> of geometric application that I want to discuss with you. Uh, so yeah, so now the idea is to, uh, is to consider so, um, the, following, the following setting. So the, uh, one of the um, important geometric feature of, uh, of general relativity is to understand whether or not there is appearance of singularity in the underlying metric. So you have, uh, let's say, you study the Cauchy problem, you make the evolution of, the, uh, of this, uh, let's say, space-like uh, hypersurface, you let it evolve, and then you would like to understand if the resulting space-time obtained as the evolution of your initial datum still has uh, some regularity or not, uh, and if it is extendable or not in a certain sense. So this is uh, somehow so much related to what is called the uh, cosmic censorship conjecture. So to understanding if once that you have a, a development of your initial datum, then the final object can be extended in a certain sense or not. So just let me be that vague. So, but the idea is that somehow, if you're able to say that uh, your uh, the, the object that you have obtained has some singularity that prevents this uh, extendability, then somehow you are happy. So motivated by this general picture of trying to understand whether or not singularities appear in this, in this framework, we, we uh, try to understand if uh, even in, at this level of, uh, of, uh, of generality, where you have just synthetic version of uh, uh, Lorentzian spaces, you are able or not to generalize one of the most famous singularity theorem that takes the name of Hawking, that is this Hawking singularity theorem. So Hawking singularity theorem somehow says that once that you have uh, uh, an energy condition that says that the reach is non-negative and you couple it with a, a somehow a focusing condition, it means that somehow geodesic are somehow tending to, time like geodesic are tending to focus, then somehow the space cannot be prolonged too much. So the, the space has to end at some point. The space time has to end at some point. You have an upper bound on the existence of, uh, of, uh, of time like geodesic up to a certain point. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so the idea of this, uh, for reformulating these focusing conditions of the time like geodesic was indeed to formulate in this, in the, in the, uh, in this setting a notion of mean curvature for space-like uh, surfaces. So first of all, you have to reformulate what it means somehow to have a space-like uh, surfaces because uh, if you are in the, in the classical setting, space-like just means that the tangent space at each point uh, just sees the, uh, the space-like directions of your Lorentzian metric. Uh, here, what you say is that the set is acronal. Acronal means that, uh, so B is a subset of our ambient space, is acronal if you cannot find the two points that are in time-like uh, time relation one with each other. So it means that you cannot go from one point in another one by using a massive particle, okay? And uh, so this is somehow, it's uh, this saying that your space, it's a, uh, space-like more or less. So you can think about it as a hypersurface that it's just space-like tangent. And uh, moreover, you want, since we want to have uh, normal variations in order to formulate a notion of mean curvature, what you also have to have uh, is that the time, let's say the distance function from this space-like uh, hypersurface has to be regular. So you want to be able to define normal variations. And this is encoded into uh, saying somehow that uh, you are able to find a kind of, pro for, for each point in the future of uh, this space-like uh, set, so from this acronal set, uh, has a projection on it in the sense of uh, the time separation function. So this notion has been introduced by Galloway and says that a, a subset, an acronal set B is a future time-like complete, uh, is uh, as soon as you pick one point in the future, so X in A plus of B means that X is in a time-like future of, uh, of B, then you take the causal path, so you take all of the uh, points that can be joined uh, from 
from X with causal uh, geodesics, so meaning allowing also to, to have light like uh, uh, so particle without mass. This one, once that you intersect back, the, the, the set has to have compact closure inside, inside B. And you can define the same thing from, from below. So somehow once you go to the future and then you go back, you just have compact, compact closure. This is enough to uh, properly define the analogous of the, of the distance function from this, from, from this uh, space-like uh, set, and is the sine time separation function is that it's not a byte all D. So now here again, there is this difference between the infimum and the superior. So you have to take the supremum. So the, the distance from uh, this time separation function from V at point X is just the supremum of all the possible uh, time separation function from with base point in V. So the supremum over Y in V of this distance here and analogous for the, for the past. And what you see is that uh, if uh, this space is sufficiently good, let's say globally hyperbolic and geodesic, uh, and if you have an acronal and future timeline complete, uh, then somehow for each point in the future, you have a projection on, the, on your acronal set. So this somehow means that you are able to make, to detect a normal direction. And uh, indeed using uh, this property, using this normal direction, we managed to formulate a second order variation of the, of the volume, of the volume M, somehow starting from your acronal set B. So let's say you have your set B, you're making uh, an enlargement using this special direction, you're making a second variation, and this can be encoded into uh, uh, a bound on the mean curvature of the set B. So this generalization of this Hawking singularity theorem is the following one. So you have uh, this time like no branching uh, and uh, okay, let's say that it's a uh, well, so the causal structure are well behaved. So th this means that it's uh, somehow the causal diamonds have to be compact. Uh, that, let's just say like this and it's uh, geodesic. And if you assume just the time like mesh contraction property with parameter K and N, and you also have to assume that the reverse structure satisfies the same, otherwise, uh, yeah, you have to assume that, that also the, the, the reverse time like, uh, the reverse causality uh, structure satisfies the same. And then you pick this set here, VU, that has to be acronal and future time like complete. So let's say that it's a well behaved space like hyper surface of your, of, your, of your space X, and assume that it has uh, a mean curvature bounded above by a constant h plus when you're making outside uh, outside variations and now we see which range of parameters so let's say just focus on the case in which you have uh, a no negative uh, <coughs> uh, lower bounds on the time like which curvature here as, as you expect you have a negative upper bound so it means that somehow you are curving in this direction so if you have an upper bound a negative upper bound on the mean curvature of uh, this space like set then you have an upper bound on how much the space time can be extended in the future. So this means that as soon as you have X in the future of V, then there exists, uh, you have that it's time separation function from V has to be bounded from above by a certain constant D that just depends on the parameters of the curvature in the dimension and the curvature on the mean curvature of the, of, of your set B. And, um, and okay, I will not write down the, ex the explicit expression for, so the expression for this, but this is a completely explicit and it's uh, just accordingly to, to what happens in the, in the smooth setting. So somehow this means that uh, as soon as you have uh, every time like geodesic start, oh sorry, here should be X. So every time like geodesic gamma leaving from, from V, then its maximal domain of, of definition has to be contained inside this uh, bounded interval. And this is a, can be rephrased by saying that X is not time like geodesically complete. So it means that you cannot prolong uh, forever time like geodesic. That some other should be an end to the space time once that you have uh, this focusing condition on these space like uh, other surfaces. And okay, so this is a, uh, this theorem has a very long history. So we are just uh, adding a, a little uh, contribution to this very long list of, uh, of people that already give uh, important contributions. So, it was uh, originally proved by Hawking for a smooth space time for C2 metric with compact uh, space like slice. Mm -hmm. So it was concerned with space like compact space like slices. It was then uh, extended by Kunziger and collaborators in, for a C11 metric. I think still using uh, in 2015, I think still using uh, uh, a smoothness, uh, so a smoothing procedure and for a C1 metric by Melanie Graf in 2020. And um, still, 
in the compact with compact space, space like slices, uh, and it was then extended to to the non-compact setting, but with a so with a non-compact uh, uh, slice space like slice, but with a smooth metric by Galloway in '86 and extended again by Graf to C11 metric in in 2016. It has also recent version for uh, by Alexander Graf Kunzger and Semen, where they proved uh, uh, the same type of result for. Uh, let's say the analogous of Lorentz and Warpet product, uh, where they were assuming a lower boundary sectional curvature that has been, there, let, let's say that there is a, a, an analogous um, theory of Alexandrov spaces also for Lorentz and spaces introduced, I think, by Kunziger and Saman in, uh, in 2018. And uh, more or less during the same period in which we obtain our result, uh, uh, Annegret Burscher, Christian Ketter, Robert McCann, and Eric Wolger obtained. Uh, uh, a similar similar result in the Riemannian version of open singularity theorem in uh, for CD spaces where they somehow prove that once that you have a set uh, with a lower bound uh, with an upper bound on the mean curvature, then somehow its inner radius cannot be too big. Mm. So more or less, it's uh, it's following the same stream of ideas. Mm. And uh, so compared with the smooth setting, uh, we have relaxed this uh, this compactness by just assuming that uh, we have. Uh, Non compact in a compact situation, and also we are not just dealing with only with this. Uh, we relax also this future causal completeness, but just time like causal completeness. Okay, and again, by the uh, approximation result that I've uh, shown you before, with this uh, with the compatibility of uh, this synthetic version with the distributional case, we also recover uh, with our result the C1 plus non branching and the C11 case. Okay, so. Uh, to, to give uh, a little bit more of, uh, of details on uh, how this actually is working. Well, the idea to make these normal variations, uh, somehow you have to, let's say, we now I just want to say, spend a few words on how you can give a precise meaning to this, to this sentence here. So having forward mean curvature bounded above by H plus for a set, oh, sorry, here should, should be X, so the subset of X, sorry. Uh, so let me just give, a more precise meaning to having forward mean curvature bounded above by, by H plus. So the idea is that uh, um, if, you if you want to do the same uh, kind of story in the, so what you would do for, uh, so let's say that the play role by the distance function from a set here, as I said before, should be played by the time separation function from B. As we've seen, uh, I mean, the, one of the axiom of the, Lorentz and Pruden spaces is that they have to satisfy the reverse triangular inequality. And the reverse triangular inequality, once that you bring one term on the other side, can be written in this form. So if you have uh, that y is in the causal future of x, sorry, x is in the causal future of y, then you should have the, the, the time separation function from b minus the time separation function from y has to be larger than this quantity here. So somehow the time separation function from b is what is called a, a reverse one Lipschitz function. And somehow you want to, what you can do, you can somehow uh, select those direction, giving somehow the normal direction when you would like to make invariations of the volume by those direction where you actually reach the identity here, starting from the, uh, instead of having an inequality, you want to have an identity. This is somehow giving you um, precise directions where you would like to, uh, that you would like to follow in order to have, uh, to live uh, as fast as possible from, uh, uh, from this space like set B. And uh, now that you start doing these things, then you realize that it's uh, very close to uh, L1 theory of, uh, of optimal transport and you can somehow try to follow that path and understand what's, uh, what is the structure behind this normal direction. You, you, you say that, you, you see that this set here, gamma is actually cyclically monotone with respect to the cost function L. And this means that you are able, once that you, it's a part of the knowledge that once that you have a L cyclically monotone set, then you can do an equivalence relation and, uh, and the equivalence classes of these equivalence relations are just this maximal gray leaving with the maximal steep from this space-like direction B. So what you end up with, with a, with a foliation of, uh, of the unparam let's say that you end up with an unparametrized, sorry, to have, you end up with a family of an unparametrized time-like geodesics that are called usually in the literature of transport race in this classical theory. 
so that the future of V is just foliated by all of this family of uh, unparameterized uh, transport rays. So once that you have a foliation, what you do, you make a disintegration just by constructing a quotient, a quotient, so a, a measurable selection, but this is uh, not, so, not so interesting. Let's say that you are able to somehow make a conditional measure out of this condition here. And uh, what you end up with, you can now use the curvature assumption to transfer the regularity of the space formulated in terms of the uh, of this concavity of this displacement convexity of the entropy to a regularity property for these conditional measures. And somehow this is the thing that you would like to uh, to have. Let's say that in the end, what you what you end up with, you end up with uh, with a, a foliation of the future of V in terms of uh, let's say uh, light like uh, sorry time like geodesics. Uh, along which if you just see the conditional measures, they are absolutely continuous with respect to the, the back measure, and they satisfy the classical curvature dimension condition, so with this parameter. So if you see, if you regard this one as a classical metric measure space of, of dimension one, this will be a CDKN space. If you want, this can be rephrased in a little bit more uh, handy way by saying that this density, once they are raised to the one over N minus one, these are concave. So you have plenty of regularity to play with, and to formulate uh, the proper uh, second variation of the volume just by making second variations of this density here. Mm -hmm. I don't want to give any more detail. Let me just conclude by saying that adopting uh, a, similar, uh, a similar strategy, you can also, uh, you can also prove uh, uh, some geometric inequalities. Uh, and here I reported the, the sharp version of the Brumenkowski inequality. This can also be uh, has been also deduced by, by uh, Matthias Brown, where he was just considering the classical, so not the entropic versions, but, but the classical TCD condition, but where this uh, Broome and Koski inequality just follows by a direct applications of the, um, uh, by just applying to, uh, to uh, uniform measures. But here, using this trick of localization, we're able to, sorry, with this trick of studying the time separation functions from, and, and, and studying this regularity of this normal field, we are able anyway to, to obtain uh, the time-like version of the Broome and Koski inequality. Here, uh, the formulation is the following one. So assume that you have uh, a metric measure space that satisfies, so, uh, sorry, a Lorentz and Freeland space satisfies the weak time-like curvature dimension condition, and you have to have two uh, subset, and you have, want to have that the one is in the future of the other, but you have to formulate this one in terms of the optimal transfer of Lorentz and optimal transfer. So this means that uh, once that you see, you pick the renormalized reference measure on both, you have to assume that to be strongly time-like one dualizable. So that means that there exists the solution of the dual Kantorovich problem uh, with exponent equal to one. Then the <coughs> measure of the set of the intermediate points, uh, just using time-like geodesic from a naught to a one raised to the power one over n is larger than this uh, weighted, so distorted concavity, concavi sorry, sorry, distorted linear combination of the volume of the initial set and, and the final one here. And uh, with this theta here coefficients just obtained by taking all the supremum or the infimum of the time separation functions between a naught and, uh, and, uh, and a one. And uh, yeah, so I will just conclude and leave here a list of possible, uh, I mean, here, obviously the theory is just uh, started. So we have plenty of uh, questions to understand and to, and to study. So I just leave here for, uh, I don't know if you want to think about it or not, but it's, let's just say that there are very interesting properties to understand. For instance, understand the full stability of the time like curvature dimension condition. Obviously we also have this dependence of the theory so far on P that it's, uh, I think uh, there is people working on that, but it's very interesting to, to a very interesting problem. Uh, obviously here, what it's still missing, it's a pre-compactness for this class of uh, spaces so far. And um, also the, let's say that the, the typical argument of Gromov by using the doubling to infer, so using the rich lower bound to infer local doubling and from there uh, a pre-compactness argument does not work because uh, local doubling here, it's uh, a bit tricky. There is a recent definition of uh, Causally doubling given by McCann and Simon, this would be very interesting to, to understand the relations between these two things. And obviously also now that we also have in the same, again, introduced by McCann and Simon, a notion of a Hausdorff measure model 
on the causal cones. So it's somehow an analog of the Hausdorff measure, but in the Lorentzian setting. Also here, for people expert in the uh, equivalent of dimensional condition, we know that once that you put a reference measure to the Hausdorff measure, then you have extra property of the space. So here is also would be very nice to have uh, further development in that uh, in that direction. And I think my time is over. So yeah. Thank you. Questions? Yeah, uh, I have just, uh, maybe I missed some, some point. At some point you defined, uh, okay, I'm just ignoring. You defined the mean curvature mm -hmm. in the synthetic sense. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not so familiar with the concept, so maybe you. Yeah. Maybe yeah, actually, I haven't, defi I haven't defined it. So uh, yeah. it's just, uh, what yeah. I said is that. How so do you define it? Uh, I, I, what I would like to do is to say that now that I have uh, this, Let me write here. So once that I have decomposed uh, this measure here in the time-like direction, so mm -hmm. here this x alpha has to be understood as normal directions. Mm -hmm. So what you can do, you can somehow say that uh, I am doing uh, an enlargement of, so I start from V, I'm taking uh, an epsilon neighborhood of V only using these directions, so these normal directions, and I compute the volume that I will have of this three. But then somehow what you have, you can do the second derivative of this function here. So the first derivative would be the volume and the second derivative would be the mean curve. Okay. Yeah. And it's a bit, I mean, here the issue is that possibly this, I mean, here V is not sufficiently regular to ensure that from one point of V, you only have one normal direction. So you could possibly have one of more of this normal direction leaving from one point, for instance, if you have cusps or things like that. So you have to be a bit more careful. That's why I haven't written down you have to be a bit more careful when you formulate this, this, this way of doing variations. And normal variations. So you have to take care of these possible uh, angles where you have more than one normal direction leaving. But somehow the idea behind is that you make just a second derivative of this enlarge, of the volume of the enlargement uh, in, uh, in normal directions. Okay, thank you very much. So uh, is there also as a kind of next step some analytic object like a wave operator or whatever which replaces the Laplacian on static spaces? Uh, well, this is a uh, yeah. I mean, you could do it, uh, but it's still uh, let's say uh, an ongoing uh, investigation. So it's uh, so yeah. I don't know. Yeah, let's say that uh, if you want to go in that direction of uh, defining, for instance, uh, infinitesimal libertianity and uh, this kind of object that uh, obviously you can do it. Uh, let's say that you can somehow, uh, the basic idea, you can, you, can, you can follow that direction, but then let's say that, again, the crucial stability properties uh, would be very complicated to, to obtain now because the stability of RCD goes from uh, path that here is not, uh, it's not so you can give the definition, but then it's uh, still lacking some uh, substantial ideas to, yeah, to have a reasonable definition. <clears throat> okay, so thank you again. Thanks. <laughs>is the classical optimal transport problem, thank you, when uh, the cost function is the distance function. And it, in its Munch formulation, it, it consists in finding the infimum among all t maps with, which push mu into nu 
uh, of the integral of the distance function. And we know that the problem can be imposed, so it has a relaxed formulation, uh, which is the Kantorovich formulation, where, where we uh, look for infimum of, um, of the integral of the distance function among all uh, p uh, plants, which, um, which are admissible plants between mu and nu, so which have first and second marginal uh, equal to mu and nu. Uh, a classical question about the problem is uh, when um, understanding when there exists a map T which realizes uh, the infimum in the Munch problem. So there have been several contributions years ago in the smooth setting. Uh, I won't go into details. What I wanted to say is that uh, in the no smooth setting of metric measure spa metric spaces, um, the problem has been uh, studied by the Pascal Errigo in the Eisenberg group. Then uh, by Bianchini and Cavalletti, um, who considered non-branching spaces uh, plus, um, which satisfies some additional hypothesis. And finally, uh, and also they proved that spaces satisfying the MCPKN condition um, fall into these cases. And finally, Cavalletti extended to the essentially non-branching case um, of CDKN spaces and to uh, the case of the Wiener space. And this last case is uh, what we will focus on because uh, our aim was to, um, to study the problem of finding the optimal map uh, in, a, in a metric measure space in some sense of an infinite dimension. So um, as has, has been already said, um, one can consider a synthetic theory or rich equivalent lower bound. Uh, given a metric, space, a metric measure space, one can define the Shannon, the Shannon entropy. And through this entropy, it can be defined a no smooth anal analog of uh, having rich equivalent bounded from below by K. And if one consider an entropy which uh, takes into account also of a parameter N, um, one can define uh, the no smooth analog of having uh, rich equivalent bounded from below by k and dimension bounded from above by n. So we will use both these conditions. And in particular, um, the space in which we um, in which we will put ourselves is a product space as a first example of uh, CDK infinity space. So we consider a sequence of uh, CDK n spaces which are non-branching and mm, which satisfies, uh, yes, the CDKN condition for some finite n. We also assume this um, summability condition on the diameters. Then we define uh, uh, for any n the product of the first n components uh, by taking the product set, the distance given by the Pythagorean theorem and the product measure. We want that this space satisfies still the CDKN condition for some finite n. And finally, uh, our setting will be the one of um, infinite product space. So we consider X infinity, the infinity, and M infinity. And it, turn, it turns out that it is a metric measure space and that satisfies uh, itself the CDK infinity condition. Okay, so uh, what, what one can prove is that um, in this setting, given two probability measures, which are absolutely continuous with respect to the reference measure, if their densities are bounded and they are mutually singular, then there exists a solution to the Munch problem. And actually uh, the strategy that uh, can be followed is a classical strategy, which uses uh, the partition into transport rays. Uh, for, we know that for this strategy, uh, it is, um, it is necessary to have, to have some regularity of the conditional measures that we will see later uh, better what does it mean. And we got this regularity in finite dimension for our finite uh, product spaces by using the localization theorem and in infinite dimension uh, by using um, approximation by finite, uh, finite dimensional spaces and the product structure. Actually, what I wanted to add is that uh, the motivation that I had to start the study of uh, this, this problem was to try to understand 
start the understanding of uh, what happens for the localization of the CDK infinity condition. So um, we can go no, now to, through the main steps of the proof. Uh, first of all, the, um, the, main, the classical ingredient is to use a partition into transport rays. To use this, we need to introduce the dual formulation of the L1 optimal transport problem. So uh, we consider the supremo mongol one Lipschitz function of the integral of phi mu minus phi mu. Uh, we know that a maximizing phi is a counter of its potential. And once that we have this maximizing phi, or in general a one Lipschitz function, uh, some sets are defined. Okay, I won't go into the details. But uh, what, uh, what I want to consider is that it, it can be defined a transport set with endpoints through the through phi, which is the set where basically the transport happens and that one needs to consider to describe, uh, to study the optimal transport problem. And if one consider on these sets, the sets where phi increases exactly um, with slope one, then um, these sets turns tur tur out to be geodesics, which can intersect only at initial and final points. So um, if one considers the non-branch transport set by taking the transport set with endpoints and keeping away the, the endpoints, what one gets is that um, one has an asset which um, which is made of G D six, so which 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 do, do not intersect, uh, which do not intersect. So basically, summing up, we have that uh, one set we have a Kantorovich potential. We consider the non-branch transport set, and we have an equivalence relation by taking the set that I described before. And the equivalence classes for this equivalent relation are G D six. And if one considers its closure, uh, they can intersect only at their initial and final points. Okay, so once that we have this partition, uh, the second uh, important tool uh, which is classically used is the disintegration theorem. Um, in particular, what we have is that if we start from a probability measure and we restrict it to the non-branch transport set that we have constructed before, and we consider the partition into the equivalent classes, then there exists a family of measures uh, um, MQ, where Q is the set of uh, Q lies in the set in a set of indexes, um, which allow to to write uh, the measure M restri restricted to the non-branch transport set as the integral over this family of measure of um, of this family of measure with respect to a measure on the quotient set Q. Um, and in particular, this family of, of measure is strongly consistent with the partition. That means that we have a fam we have we start from the partition and we have a family of measures, each of them concentrated on the corresponding element of the partition. Okay, so um, once again we started uh, from our problem. We constructed a um, partition of the of the set, and we disintegrated the measure by getting a family of measures uh, concentrating on these sets. And if the space, the starting space, uh, satisfies some um, some curvature assumption, as, as Fabio before said, then um, it can be proved that uh, the the geodesics uh, element of the partition with the, with these conditional measures satisfy themselves the same curvature dimension. Yes. Um, okay, for, I think that for the disintegration, uh, it, it is not important finite to infinite m. Uh, it will play a, it will play a role later, I would say. Okay, so. Um,
yeah basically for the i think that if i'm not wrong for the disintegration it is enough to have a accountably generated space so when you are metric uh, complete and separable it should be okay. it should be okay um okay so the last the last uh, easy tool that we need is um, the monotone rearrangement in one dimension so if we have a two probability measure and the first measure has, has no atoms one can consider the monotone rearrangement between mu and mu and one has that um, one has that the monotone rearrangement is an optimal map for the l1 optimal transport problem Okay, the fundamental lemma to solve the problem is uh, states that if we start from a, co from a metric space and we have two probability measure, we consider a Kantorovich potential for the L1 optimal transport problem, we do the construction that we considered before, then um, we disintegrate. What we want is that if the mu measure of the initial points and the mu measure of the final points are zero. And if disintegrating the first measure with respect to the partition, then the first measure has no atom, um, then there exists an optimal map and for the L1 problem. And this map is uh, constructed, um, constructed by disintegrating mu and nu by taking the optimal map, the monotone arrangement between uh, mu q and nu q and then uh, by gluing all the maps uh, together. Okay. So uh, basically the effort was to prove that these two hypotheses are satisfied. And in particular, um, to prove that they are satisfied, um, one can prove that there exists a positive evolution. Let's see in which sense. Let's see in which sense. So we will say that um, given a set A of a subset of a metric space and gamma uh, of the product, the, the evolution of a set A via gamma at time t will be made as follows. We intersect gamma with A times x. Then um, we take couples of this set and we take the set of t midpoints uh, between uh, the couples. So our goal, uh, as I said, is to prove that we have a positive evolution. In particular, uh, what we want to prove is that if um, we want to prove that there exists a, pin a pi infinity, which is optimal between, uh, um, for the L1 problem between mu and nu, which satisfies that for any gamma subset of the product, which has pi infinity measure one, then uh, for any A set, uh, Okay, of positive measure, the, um, we have a positive evolution. So the evolution is positive with a, with, a, with a constant C. And if this is satisfied, one can prove that hypothesis one and two are satisfied. Let's see one example. So um, let's see why mu of the initial point is zero. We assume by contradiction that is the, it is positive. Then what we have is that um, the evolution at time t of uh, the set A, intersected A, is, uh, is the empty, empty set by definition of it, the initial points. And that um, if t is small enough, of course, we are in an epsilon neighborhood of, um, of the initial points. Now, uh, so we have uh, two disjoint sets subset of the same epsilon neighborhood of AFI. And for the second set, we have a positive estimate from below. So we can, we can get a contradiction by sending epsilon to zero. Okay. Now, how, how did uh, one, can prove, how one can prove the positive evolution? Um, it can be done uh, with three steps. The first one is to prove that it holds in a CDK and interval for absolutely continuous measure. And um, with plan, we will take the monotone arrangement between uh, mu and nu. And we, one can prove that there exists a constant independent on n for which uh, taking any gamma subset of the graphs of the, um, 
of the monotory arrangement, one has that the measure of the evolution at time t of any set A is greater or equal of a constant times the new measure of A with the constant not depending on n. And this can be done by taking by observing that m is absolutely continuous with respect to the Lebesgue measure, which weight with the, which is a C decay and density, one can write the change of variable formula to estimate from below um, the measure of the T evolution of A. Then the estimate concludes by using that H is a CDK infinity density, and so that log H is a C concave. And at the, at the end, will, have, will appear the bound on, um, on the curvature and um, on the probability, the upper bound on the densities of mu with respect to M and mu with respect to M. Okay, so once that one has the estimate in one dimension, um, one can prove the estimate in higher dimension by using the localization theorem. And uh, we apply the estimate in higher dimension to, to the finite product uh, that we defined before. So we take uh, the finite products, we take the projection onto the first n components, then uh, by using the first step, we prove that is, if we consider the monotory arrangement a long race and we take any gamma graph of this monotory arrangement, uh, then the positive evolution holds still with constant C, which uh, not depends on M. And um, yeah, as I said, the key tools are uh, the first step, the, the fact that you can uh, have an optimal map by gluing monetary arrangement and the localization theorem, which allows to apply the first step. And finally, um, okay, so finally, how did uh, we pass to, to, higher, to the infinite product space? We take, um, okay, we have PN, the, which are the plants, um, induced uh, by the map, the map TN. And we take um, its their, uh, their weak limit, T infinity, and we prove that the positive evolution can be um, passed to the limit in some sense, so that we have the positive evolution still with constant on depending on N in the infinite product. And uh, what can be um, a crucial point is that we can do we can do the step for uh, for sets which are cylindrical cylindrical set and satisfy for n big uh, that mu n of a is equal to mu of a for any n. Okay. So as I said, once set one has uh, this positive evolution, then the existence of optimal maps follows. And finally, uh, as I already said. Um, the, the, the motivation to study this problem was to understand whether a localization theorem could hold in a CDK infinity space. And in particular, so if one can uh, localize to raise the CDK infinity condition, we try to attack the case of infinite product uh, of CDK and spaces. And basically the main, uh, the main difficulty is to prove that the conditional measure are, are absolutely continuous with respect to the house of measure on the race. And a very weak result could be that uh, we have the continuity of, uh, of the measure around race. So we are the, the measure on non-atomic. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Sorry, can you explain once more on your last slide, what do you mean by the continuity of the measures? Yeah, uh, only that the measure are non-atomic. Well, we, pro we prove that um, what follows from... from this theorem, from by applying this lemma, is that uh, if, if one disintegrate uh, the first measure and the second measure with respect to um, the partition, then mu q and mu q are non-atomic from which we only can deduce that 
the MQ in the sets where the densities are positive are non-atomic. Sorry, I still don't. What What do you mean by monotone? Do you just mean uh, uh, do you mean something beyond the fact that they have no atoms? Yes, non-atomic. That's all you mean. Yes. That's what monotone means. Non-atomic. I was saying. Non I think. Non-atomic. Okay. Yes. All right, thanks. Um, I have a question um, regarding this theorem, like the cost and the I mean the distance and the infinite product space is very often infinite, so the transport cost could also be infinite. Do we need to assume that this cost uh, between the two measures is finite to prove the existence uh, of, of the map? Or like, do you also obtain something when the okay. transport cost is, is infinite? Okay, so I think you have to assume that the cost is, is finite. I, I haven't thought about it. Uh, yeah. I think you have to. Okay. Okay, so I also have a question, Sarah. In your initial uh, statement, you require the two measures to be mutually singular, yes. which is usually not needed in the standard theory. Do you really need it? It's really uh, yes. The the point is that uh, okay. I, I don't know if it, oh, just one moment. Okay, I don't know. Uh, if it is necessary, but uh, what what I was not not able to uh, to well without this this, hypo this hypothesis plays a role when um, okay we want I, I said that this uh, this should be verified for any gamma uh, this is because I want gamma to be uh, I w what one takes here is a gamma which is a subset of the race. And which is disjoint from the diagonal, because if gamma it is not when you evolve, you are not sure that these are disjoints. So if the, the if you cannot take gamma which is disjoint from the diagonal or measure, well the measure one uh, plays a role into getting here new, and if you cannot take that gamma is disjoint from the diagonal. Uh, this estimate, in some sense, can be trivial. So you evolve and you get the same set plus uh, other. You can remove the part of the diagonal and you get new measures, new and new, which now are singular. And then you apply this result to the singular, uh, the part which are singular, and then you add the part which is the identity. For, for the plan, yes, but for the map, uh, I, I, I guess for the L1 case, it's a possible strategy where you don't move uh, if you are in the same set. So it's maybe. You what you take? Uh, thanks for your talk. Um, so I assume that this must, the result must actually be false if the space is branching or like a non essentially non branching. Um, but do you, so do you think that this um, uh, is that is that correct? Do you know? Uh, sorry. So you are asking if it holds in non-essentially non-branching. Yeah, if you have a, a a positive section of the reference measure where you have the branching on the underlying space, okay. I would imagine that the result is false. But I'm asking, do you know? Uh, well. In general, uh, also for the finite, the, you mean the localization, or? Uh, I'm just asking if um, you can have a non-existence of the uh, um, opti the optimizer in the Monge problem mm -hmm. if you're working over a branching CDKN space. I don't know the literature. I'm just wondering if you if you know. Mm, no, I don't know. I see. So, so I mean, could you say maybe where in the proof you need the non-branching assumption? Uh, yes. 
uh, well, the non-branching assumption is classically used uh, to have a good partition. So to prove that, um, to prove that, yes, you have a partition of the transport set. You can generalize to the non-branching, to the essentially non-branching uh, case where you do not prove that initial and final points have measure zero, but you prove that branching points have measure zero. I don't know for the non-branching case. Thank you. Okay, so I think uh, we should thank again the speaker. And, uh, and now I think we are more or less on time for the, for the lunch and we come back at, at 2, 2 p.m., right? Okay, so I think we are in time. We welcome back to this afternoon session. The first speaker today is uh, Dario Trevisan from PISA. He will talk about optimal transport methods for combinatorial optimization over two random point sets. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Luigi. Thank you all for, for being here. I know this is the last afternoon of the conference. It's been an amazing conference, but uh, being a local, I also missed uh, some of your talks uh, because I had teaching. So. Uh, I hope also this talk will be not so technical. I try to put as many pictures as possible, uh, but it's based on a joint work. Uh, is it working? Yeah, uh, maybe. Okay, we put it a bit closer. Okay, maybe better. So uh, the this is based on a joint work with uh, Michael Goldman, and uh, but also we use a lot of techniques uh, from uh, collaborations uh, also with Luigi. So uh, what is the motivation here? Uh, we want to study combinatorial optimization problems, in short, uh, COPs, uh, that are discrete uh, variational problems, uh, and typically they are formulated on weighted graphs, graphs uh, or weighted graphs, so, so the edges have weights, uh, and they are, uh, so you can find them everywhere, and typically this is the, uh, the framework of uh, operation research, essentially, with a lot of applications to planning, logistics, and so on. So I would not enter into the abstract formulation of these problems, although we, we cover this in our, we try to cover and be a bit general in our uh, paper. But let's focus on a simple and perhaps the most popular one, which is the traveling salesperson problem, so the TSP. And what is the problem? You, you are given a set of cities and distances between these cities, and cities, and you need, uh, so this corresponds to nodes in a graph, and the distances uh, are essentially the weights you put on the connections. And you're looking for the shortest uh, path uh, through all these uh, cities. Actually, you want a cycle, so you want to begin and end at the same uh, point, visiting all the cities. And so it is known, it's very well known, that the TSP is an anti-hard problem. Uh, so computing uh, uh, an exact solution becomes uh, generally intractable. So it, the known algorithms uh, are, uh, okay, good on a small uh, uh, number of cities, but as the number of cities grows, uh, you, you have, uh, it's very hard to compute essentially the, the, the exact solution. Now, in real world applications, anyway, we want to solve this type of problems. Okay, the TSP is possibly a toy problem, but uh, typically these MP hard problems uh, uh, appear uh, pop up in many applications. But uh, you're not really in the general instance, but you could exploit perhaps some geometry of your problem, so the way cities are located around, but also randomness. Why randomness? Because uh, uh, essentially you want to solve uh, possibly many, many instances. Think, for example, of, uh, of, an, uh, of Amazon, every day they must plan uh, the, 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 the route for the delivering. And so you want to, every day it will change a bit, but maybe not so much. So essentially you can think of a series of random instances of these problems. Okay, so we want to exploit these two uh, factors. And uh, in fact, we're not the first one to, to think about this problem. So already in the 70s, uh, Carf uh, noticed that uh, if you pick the cities uh, as uh, random samples of uh, IID points, say, uniform in a region, then you can find uh, approximations, but uh, to any order of the TSP problem, uh, the, sorry, the TSP, in uh, essentially via, via partitioning scheme, uh, and which is very, very fast, essentially, not, uh, not as you would expect uh, given the NP hardness of the problem. Okay, so uh, let's give, uh, let's uh, show some pictures. So let's say that we have these the cities around and we sample 50 of these uh, cities. So what are we searching for in the TSP? So we are searching for uh, the, the shortest cycle where the length is really the length in this case, okay? So imagine that for every pair of cities, you have the Euclidean length. So it's not really as you have in real life, you have 
uh, streets, but really you can jump from one city to another by paying the cost given by the Euclidean law. And this is a solution computed uh, by the, the computer, essentially. So, uh, CARP, uh, this is not uh, uh, via the scheme uh, by CARP. This is exactly the, the solution, okay, with an exact solver. So, but CARP was not even the first uh, studying this problem. Actually, the first uh, instance of uh, a theorem related to this uh, random combinatorial optimization is due to the, these three authors, uh, Birdwood, Halton, and Amesley, uh, in short, BHH. So we have this nice theorem, which is essentially the first of a long series of theorems of BHH type. Essentially, these are low large numbers for our problem. Essentially, if you take n IID points, say random points, uh, say xi between one and n, uh, IID and distributed according to a, to a common density rho, say that this density is a bounded support, say uniformly in a bounded region, and then you let, for example, C, TSP uh, of XI, the, the cost, the random, it will be a random variable because it depends on the generation of these points. So the random len uh, length of the solution to the TSP through these random points. So these are random variables, uh, and n, uh, as n grows, uh, you would expect uh, to have a sort of uh, low large number. And in particular, you can prove that T almost surely, if you take this random variable and you uh, multiply by this factor n to the one over d minus one, so it depends on the dimension, now we're going to see how, you almost surely converge to a limit. A limit which is given by a constant uh, which depends only on the dimension, so is the BHH constant, if you want, depends on the dimension d, times uh, you have an integral of the weight uh, due to the common distribution rho. It's the integral of rho to the power of one minus d, okay? Uh, yeah, random solution in the sense that it depends, it's random because once you fix uh, the points uh, xi, uh, you compute exactly the solution. So it will be still a random variable, but it's, uh, say, the only source of randomness is given is the position of the points, essentially, right? So you're given these points, like in the picture before, and then you solve, you take your solver and you want to solve this problem, okay? So if you solve it exactly, you will have this uh, still a random variable because it depends on the the way the points were distributed, right? The exact realization of the points. Now, just a quick uh, um, word on the scaling. So the scaling, why we need to multiply by this n one over d minus one, which is essentially to divide by n to the one minus one over d. So this is because we have n cities, which are uniformly distributed, say, on a, on a cube. You can think of the simplest case. So you expect that the, this, uh, this is so these uh, roots uh, are essentially, say, if they were on a grid, you would expect that the typical length, uh, if the cities were exactly on a grid, would be of order n to the one minus, uh, uh, so sorry, n to the minus one over d, okay? This is a simple thing. If you think in dimension one or in dimension two, you understand that this is the typical length of your problem. Of course, it's typical. There might be longer connections or shorter connections. And another feature which may be interesting <laughs> Uh, of this problem is that this BHH constant, uh, it exists and is uh, strictly positive and finite, but uh, it's not known explicitly. So there are no formulas for this, uh, only approximations that are upper and lower bounds, uh, but I'm not sure there's a systematic way to compute it uh, uh, at up to any order of precision, essentially. This is, I mean, I know they, there are upper and lower bounds in the literature. Of this. So Let's give a, a look at uh, other pictures uh, just because we are relaxed. Uh, and so let's say that we sample 500 points, uh, you solve and uh, you get a nice uh, uh, TSP solution, a nice cycle. If you grow the number, you will have always this type of sort of space filling curves uh, that, uh, that are random anyway, so because the points are uh, randomly distributed. So you're, it's a sort of a space filling curve which is, uh, which is uh, random, right? Uh, Anyway, we are not uh, exactly interested in this type of problems. So these are combinatorial optimization problems over a single set of points, say the, the cities. And for this type of problems, essentially the theory is, uh, is mature, is well developed. So in this is called the Euclidean Additive Functional Theory, which was developed, uh, say, in the 80s and 90s by a set of authors, uh, including Papadimitru, Steele, and Jukic. So they, they picked the original BHH theorem and they tried uh, to work out uh, more general and way, way more general uh, uh, arguments uh, to cover many other COPs. For example, the minimum spanning tree is a typical combinatorial optimization problem. 
but also the minimum matching problem, which means uh, that you have this uh, set of points uh, and you try just to, to marry a couple of these points, uh, right? Uh, you just need to connect uh, two in pairs, uh, two of them. Uh, we will see the bipartite version of this is uh, what we, we would call uh, the optimal transform problem. But this is not the bipartite version. And more general, uh, you can also develop the theory for general weights. So you take instead of the power of the distance, so instead of just the distance between the two points, uh, you take a pith power of the distance, which for us is very natural because in optimal transport uh, already we know that you can take the distance at some power p. But typically this is motivated by, by modeling needs. Uh, for example, you, are, you don't want to really study the Euclidean distance, but uh, it's an approximation possibly of some other distance uh, or some other cost that you have in your problem. So the theory works uh, essentially uh, if P is strictly smaller than D, and what are the, the differences uh, you want to take? A P is always positive, say that P is positive between zero and D. So you need to change uh, the scaling, so because now if you weight the distance to the power P, you will still have N points, but the typical cost between them will be N to the minus one over D to the power P. So you need to change uh, the scaling uh, in the theorem to get a BHH theorem. And also now the constant BHH, uh, there's no reason to be universal. Of course, it will depend on the chosen combinatorial problem, but also it will depend on P and D. Okay, actually there are some recent results about this that they prove that actually strictly depends on D, uh, for example, or on the chosen problem. So different problems really gives you different constants, although you cannot uh, maybe compute them explicitly. And, of, and finally, as well in the integral uh, of the density to the power, you need to change the naturally the power. You get uh, rho to the one minus p over d. Okay, so these are the changes, but uh, the theory works nicely. What happens if p is larger than d? So uh, in this case, uh, the, the picture is a bit less clear. Uh, there's, there's some partial literature, but uh, essentially there is a problem. There's a problem due to the fluctuations uh, of the points because your points uh, are not really on a grid but are randomly spread around. So what happens? For example, take uh, the simple example where you see that something can go wrong is this one. So take your region and made it up as two different disjoint intervals. Okay, so you sample n points uniformly on the union of these disjoint intervals. So zero, one half, and one half, uh, three halves. Okay, uh, no, sorry, one, three halves. So they are separated by a distance one half. So now if you sample n points randomly, what happens is that uh, on each uh, of the two intervals, uh, you will see roughly half of the points, uh, but actually there are fluctuations. So the fluctuations uh, are given by the central limit theorem, or if you want, uh, you know exactly the law, it will be a binomial distribution of points uh, on each of the two intervals. And so it will be roughly n over two mm, plus minus, say these uh, oscillations of the order of square root of n. So what happens in particular that we will see uh, one point uh, in one interval at least and one point in the other interval. Actually, you will see a lot of points in one interval and a lot of points in the other interval. So a cycle, if you want to solve the TSP, a cycle will be, uh, will be forced to cross at least twice, essentially, the, this uh, length of order one half. So it, this will contribute with a cost which is given by at least one half to the power P because it will be, it will be even larger. But anyway, you will see at least this contribution. So if P is strictly larger than D, you will see that, uh, uh, so the, the cost will be always larger than the expected uh, rate, which should be N uh, to the power one minus P over D. Because if P is larger than D, this rate will be infinitesimal. And on the other side, you know that you have at least this, uh, this cost. Okay, so something happens uh, uh, above this threshold, but there are some partial results. But you need uh, to impose something on the domain, typically, as far as I know, the results cover the case of a cube, for example. But you would expect that for smooth, uh, nice, connected domains, uh, things uh, should work. Okay. Now, uh, we don't want really to study the, uh, this case uh, because uh, this is more or less developed, uh, but we want to focus on uh, combinatorial optimization problems over two random point sets. What do I mean? I mean that you take uh, two sets of n points. Uh, each of them uh, are sampled, uh, for example, with the same distribution, rho, but uh, these are prescribed in advance. So you have a set of n red points and a set of n blue points. And now the, the combinatorial optimization problem you want to solve uh, has this prescribed rule that you can only connect red and blue points. So uh, why this? Because if you have this type of problems, 
of course, uh, most of so some natural problems appear in this uh, fall into this class, and also on the other side, uh, the techniques uh, uh, for the general theory, the additive functional theory, they fail typically, or at least they don't extend easily. So the fluctuations uh, become more and more relevant. You will see. Now. So what is the typical problem uh, of this on, in this family? It's the matching, uh, the bipartite matching uh, or the uh, assignment problem with the Euclidean weights. So what, uh, what does it mean? It means that you fix uh, n points, uh, say, xi, and other n points, uh, yj, say, in Rd, and then you define uh, the matching cost, uh, say, mp, which depends on the position of the points, uh, like this, the minimum over all the permutations, which are the matchings, uh, of the sum of the distance between xi and uh, y sigma i. So sigma i will be the point assigned uh, to the point uh, i, okay, xi. And of course, we also wait with the distance to the power p because we, we, we want to, to study the dependence on p as well, okay? So you know already, maybe you recognize something related to optimal transport in this problem, right? Now, uh, but even if we don't know about the uh, optimal transport theory, say that we just want to focus on the combinatorial aspect of this, uh, we know that for a, such a problem, there are exact algorithms uh, that are polynomial. So the Hungarian algorithm uh, takes uh, approximately depends, uh, okay, n to the cube uh, or n to the four if you're not uh, very good with, uh, with implementing algorithms. So anyway, it's a polynomial number of steps, polynomial in the number of points, which is way different from uh, the NP-hard problems like the TSP, okay? So what happens instead if you, if you consider the Euclidean TSP problem in this bipartite formulation? What does it mean? It means that you take your n points which are red and the n points which are blue, and you try to find a cycle which must alternate between the two. Now I'll show you a picture. What is the interpretation? That uh, you need uh, to travel between these locations, but uh, for example, in the red locations, you need to take uh, something and then you need to deposit uh, into a blue location. So it's what uh, people call a pick and place problem. So you, you have a robot, for example, you have uh, n objects uh, which are, uh, must be put into other n locations. You don't really matter which objects uh, goes into which location, but you have some prescribed uh, source uh, uh, position and uh, target positions and you have a single robot that must do all the job, essentially. This is the interpretation. Uh, okay, this is a nice thing uh, because I, I thought that it was known, but I didn't check. It should be the case that also in this bipartite variant, uh, the Euclidean TSP is still uh, NP-hard. So if you want, this is an exercise. I, I have some ideas, but if you are really into this, uh, um, into this field, perhaps it's, it's a very simple exercise. Anyway, I believe it's still a difficult problem to solve in general. Uh, now, uh, what happens, uh, let's see uh, some simulation. So for example, we have these 50 points, uh, which are IAD sampled uniformly in the square. And now we add uh, another 50 points, which we, uh, we, we, we show blue uh, with crosses. Okay, if you don't see the blue, then these are the crosses. Okay, uh, now what uh, we want to do, for example, let's solve the bipartite matching. So the assignment problem, this means that we need uh, to connect each red point with another point, but must be blue. Okay, so we now have this constraint. And now you see that you have a nice uh, connection between red and blue points. Now, what happens if we compare, okay, it's a bit unfair, but let's compare only with the, the non-bipartite version where we have only the red points. Now you see the situation looks a bit less uh, complicated. Now, there's also this fact that these are only the 50 red points, but you see the connections are typically very small, very short connections. While in the bipartite version, here we have even more points. So you would expect that with more points, you get even shorter connections. But what happens here is that you have much longer connections, okay? So adding the blue points and prescribing that you must connect red and blue points uh, gives you shorter, uh, sorry, longer connections than the non-bipartite version, okay? But uh, we're interested in more complicated problems like this uh, TSP problem, okay? so. This is a solution to the bipartite uh, TSP over these red to blue points. Uh, and you see each red point must be followed by a blue point and so on. So you can really follow the, the cycle here. And this is again exactly computed uh, by an algorithm. Uh, so yes, we just take the general uh, algorithm and then you, you plug in the, the graph you want. Okay, so uh, if we just focus on the matching problem, what is known here? Now we see that there, there are differences uh, with respect to the classical BHH theorem. So it is known uh, since uh, the 80s at least uh, 
that if you take uh, n uh, red points and then blue points, uh, IID and uniform distributed on the cube, so typically, so the expectation of the matching uh, cost between these uh, random n points and random blue points uh, scales uh, differently according to the dimension, but differently in the sense that it's not what you expect uh, in small, in uh, low dimensions. So in dimension one and dimension two, you get some rates, uh, especially in dimension two, you see you have a log, log of n, uh, which uh, will not pop up uh, in, the, in the classical uh, BHH theorems, okay? So the rate uh, is completely different, at least in these small dimensions, and when the dimension grows larger, you enter the classical BHH uh, uh, scale, okay? So in particular for D equals two, it's a uh, old classical result, but uh, still uh, important uh, due to Itaj, Komlos, and Tuzan D, who proved exactly this scaling here, this anomalous scaling of physics. A physicist would say this is anomalous, so this is not what we expect. Now, on the other side, more recently, uh, there's been a, a positive uh, step into general BHH type theorems uh, by Barth and Bordenav, who, who proved essentially that uh, for a wide class of uh, random Euclidean uh, uh, combinatorial optimization problems, including TSP, when you do them uh, into two sets of uh, uh, endpoints, you get uh, similar rates as BHH. But what is the condition? The condition is that uh, P must not be uh, too large compared to D. Okay, so let's give exactly the, the, the statement by Bart and Bordenal. So first, let me define uh, also the bipartite cost uh, of the traveling salesman. So say that you fix a dimension and you, you fix P, and you pick N points, uh, red points in dimension D, and these are not random. For any configuration, you can define this, uh, this cost, right? You fix N points, uh, red points, and blue points, and then the cost uh, is given by this expression. So this is simply the cost of a path which connects uh, uh, of the shortest path, but the, sh the length is measured in terms of distance to the power P, okay? Now, to, to parameterize the path, uh, it's sufficient to describe what is the order of the red points and the order of the blue points. So you need just two permutations, uh, and then you, you need to jump from one red point to the next uh, blue point and so on. And of course, you need to cycle, so at the end, uh, this uh, y will, be, uh, will go back to the first one, essentially, okay? So this is simply the, uh, our convention here. So, okay, the formula is this one. But anyway, we have this cost associated to the traveling salesman problem. So the, the theorem by Barth and Bordenave is this one. So if you have a dimension, any dimension in fact, but P is smaller, strictly smaller than D over two, which is half of the threshold D of the non bipartite problem. Now you have a classical BHH theorem, both for the matching problem and for the TSP problem. And essentially, okay, here I'm saying just for the uniformly distributed points on a bounded uh, domain, okay? Then almost surely you have, the, you have the right scaling, the expected scaling uh, times the, uh, the random cost. It will converge to a constant. Of course, the constants, uh, again, will depend on the dimension, the problem, uh, but still uh, these are numbers, which actually we, we cannot compute explicitly, but uh, these are positive numbers, finite numbers, which depend on DMP and the, the problem you're considering, okay? And the integral will only reduce uh, to this uh, volume of the domain to the power p over d because it's a uniform distribution. Okay, so uh, what is the situation? Why do we have this uh, this p over 2? Uh, well, of, uh, okay, it's a technical side, but for non-uniform distribution, uh, we don't actually have the limit, but uh, we have a lim sup and a lim inf, uh, which they are thought to be, to be actually the same. So it's still an open problem to show the limit for non-uniform distribution. Now, for, uh, for example, but, Let's see for, uh, so let's stick uh, to, to uniform and distributed points. Now let's see what happens, for example, in dimension two, where we know we have the Aitai komlosh tuznadi theorem, which tells us that for the matching, uh, something must happen. Well, in fact, if you check the assumptions, uh, the, the theorem by the Hungarian group here uh, works uh, for P equal one, while instead Barthe Bordenave required P strictly smaller than D over two, which is one. So actually they don't, uh, they don't uh, uh, communicate. So these are two different uh, rates and two different uh, scales, essentially. So P equal one is not allowed in the Barthe Bordenave theorem, which works for P strictly smaller than one. So in fact, so we're, what we see here is essentially that uh, Barthe Bordenave are working in the, in the natural condition 
and they avoid uh, to discuss these uh, strange rates that appear when p becomes larger. And we can also see that the condition p smaller than d over 2 appears naturally also in the, in the same example that we did before. So take two disjoint intervals. And now, again, due to fluctuations, uh, you will have a square root of number of points in excess uh, in one of the domain, and uh, you will miss, uh, say, red points, the square root of n uh, red points in the other domain. So you need, uh, you need to match uh, all these uh, fluctuations of points uh, at a far distance, so a distance at least uh, one up, or the one up. So the cost, uh, since you have a square root of n points now to be matched, the cost will be at least the square root of n, which is much larger, uh, asymptotically larger than 1 minus p over d, if p is uh, strictly larger than d over 2. So then this threshold appears naturally. So it's uh, really parallel to what happens to the non bipartite problem, but with the threshold p equal d. Okay? Now, how does the proof uh, work? Uh, I'll tell you just uh, the, the subadditivity argument. So we see some other pictures. So let's say this is actually the same uh, BHH uh, argument, uh, but uh, for the bipartite matching here. This is uh, the original uh, uh, argument by, by Bart and Bordenave, but also uh, it, there were also previous contributions. So say that we want to solve uh, this matching problem in this large uh, uh, N uh, configuration. So we have a cube, and what we do, we just uh, cut dyadically the cube. For example, we cut uh, each side into eight, uh, I did in this case, so eight, uh, so you have uh, eight uh, squared uh, uh, subcubes, and what you do, you restrict the problem on each subcube. Now, what is the trick? Uh, the point is that if you have a sm smaller number of points, uh, but you have also something uh, which doesn't work in the good direction, because in a smaller number of points, uh, you have uh, a simpler problem to solve, but uh, there's a problem because uh, the number uh, of red and blue points uh, in each subcube uh, may not be the same. And, uh, actually, typically it will be different. So you will have an excess uh, of red or blue points. So now, once you solve uh, the problem in each subcube, uh, you remove uh, the points which, uh, which, you, which you connected. So you see all the connected points now are removed. Uh, and now we need to go to a larger scale. So let's say that we now we look at the, we join uh, these two cubes uh, and these other two cubes. So we have four cubes which are joined. Well, actually here, this is a very unlucky case because we have only red points. I say now that we join uh, these uh, four cubes here. Okay, you see, now we can connect the red and blue points in this uh, smaller region. And now we remove again uh, the connected points. Now we go to a larger scale and then we connect uh, the other points. So at the end, uh, you will still have some very large connections, very long uh, connections, but you hope uh, that will be not so many points, right? So if you try to make this argument precise, uh, what you can expect. So you can define the, the expectation of the matching cost, say, which depends on the number of points, Fn. Say that we are on the cube, okay? Now, you would expect, essentially, if you, if you don't say, if, if you dis disregard, essentially discard all the terms uh, which are due to these uh, intermediate scales, uh, and you say, okay, at the smaller scale, on the smaller cubes, uh, I have essentially the same problem, which is not truly the case, but with less, less points in any way, you get this naive inequality, essentially. You know that the cost uh, of uh, solving the problem with n points in the large cube uh, is smaller, say that you just cut uh, each uh, side in two. So you just need to solve uh, two to the d subproblems. And uh, with the less points, uh, so the number of points in each subcube will be n divided by two over d. And of course, the distances will also scale. So the distances will be uh, two to the minus p, because you are on the smaller cubes. Okay. If you plug, uh, if you just have this naive inequality, you get immediately, or at least uh, with some small effort, that you get uh, a decreasing sequence if you rescale correctly on, uh, at least on uh, powers of two. And so you get, by the fact that you have a decreasing sequence, you get uh, the existence of the limit, which should be the BHH constant. Now, the problem, of course, uh, with this method is that uh, we are discarding the error terms. Uh, this is exactly what uh, uh, you need to estimate. So the error terms uh, are really the contributions on all these steps here. So we, if you just uh, take the, the contribution at the smaller scales, you are done. But of course, you have to bound all these other contributions. And the fact, in effect, uh, uh, this is where the condition P is smaller than D over 2 enters in the Bart and Bordenave argument. OK? So and our effort was now to go above uh, the threshold. And uh, the first result uh, is essentially this one, which uh, started all the the possibility to extend it to other problems. So we, we, we were able with Michael 
in the previous paper to go above the threshold d over 2 in a dimension larger than 3 and show the existence of these limits, uh, which is not covered by the results by Bart and Bordenat. Okay, so this is a BHH theorem for any P, essentially, and d larger than 3 because uh, d equals 2 and 1 are special. So now the idea is really to bound these error terms using optimal transport. Instead of thinking of a matching problem, you really think of the relaxation of the problem, which is the optimal transport problem. And now we have a lot of other techniques. Uh, in particular, you have uh, PD techniques, uh, and you can estimate uh, a transport cost with the negative Sobolev norms, essentially. And this is related to previous works uh, and uh, answered by, by the statistical physics community, essentially this work by Caracciolo, Lucibello, Parisi, and Sicuro, and then the later work we did with Ambrosio and uh, Federico Stra in the case d equals 2. But you can go above d equals 2, and you get this type of results. Of course, the constant is, again, implicit, but uh, there's no hope to get formulas. Uh, at least I would give away any hope in this case to, to find the formula. So starting from this, we said, OK, uh, now this works for the matching. Why not uh, try to extend it to other COPs? Essentially, why don't we go to the Treblin Sesman problem? What is the difference? Well, the point is that the, the, the TSP is more complicated than the matching. You don't have a, a relaxation so, uh, from the TSP to some continuous version of the TSP, at least not straightforwardly. So uh, we can, again, we went back to the statistical physics literature. We copied a bit. <laughs> no, uh, we must really thank this group because they, they push away, uh, they push so many ideas, uh, and uh, uh, most of the time they, they really work. So in, in this nice paper by Capelli and others, uh, they studied the case of d equal t equal 2, and they proved an explicit formula for the expected value of the TSP problem on the cube, um, where you need to normalize by a strange rate, you still have a log n. But anyway, they are able to find an, an explicit concept, which is 1 over pi. Okay, it's a bit magic, but the point is the proof is very simple because it combines two things uh, that were already known. So you know that for the non-bipartite TSP, uh, actually the, the scaling is not logarithmic. So you have a, a constant, actually you can prove this inequality here. So the, the quantity in, expected, in expectation will stay bounded as n goes to infinity. And on the other side, you know that for the matching problem, there is uh, a limit. There is the answer by this, uh, this group, right? Uh, most of the quotas are the same. So you know that you need to divide by log n and you will end up being 1 over 2 pi. So where is the, why there is a factor 2 here as a difference? Well, you can see, we can see from a picture again. So how do they combine these two elements? So uh, say that these are five red points and five blue points. And now we want to solve the TSP problem. Okay, now the TSP problem, you need to find a cycle between red and blue points. Now let's, uh, for a moment, let's solve only the, the minimum matching problem. Okay, now the minimum matching problem, it turns out to be this one. So do we see anything here? Okay, so essentially what happens is that, uh, uh, this is a special case, but uh, it's not far from the, from the truth. So you can build uh, a solution to the TSP starting from a solution to the matching problem. The only thing you need to do is to specify, so say you, say you start from this red and you go to the blue, you need to specify what will be the next red. And to specify this, you just need to find a cycle through the red points. Say that you find this cycle here through the red points. And given this cycle, and given the matching, I can say you need to alternate between matching and then you go to the cycle, right? And this gives you a way to build a solution. On the other side, if you have a solution to the TSP, you see now, if you remove, say, you're alternating the connections, you will get a matching. But you could also remove the other connections. Say you remove this connection, this connection, this connection, this connection, and so on you get another matching. So any solution to the TSP gives you naturally two matchings, while starting from a matching and uh, a solution to the non-bipartite TSP, you can build a, a feasible solution to the TSP. M may not be the optimal solution. In this case, it was, op it was optimal, but typically it's not the optimal case in for larger. So now, if you combine these two simple ideas, uh, you end up with a theorem. And the two is explained by this, that uh, any TSP solution gives you two matchings, essentially. Not uh, the optimal ones, but uh, asymptotically they are essentially of the optimal rate, okay? 
So now we said, uh, okay, this is a good thing. It works in dimension two. Uh, can we do something also in higher dimensions? Can we do something more general? And of course, you realize immediately that uh, the same arguments works uh, also in dimension two, but p larger than one. But uh, the existence of this limit, uh, while in the, well, with p equal to two, it's, an, it's a known limit. It's uh, one over two pi. So uh, it's not a matter of computing, but only the fact that the limit exists uh, is an open problem so far. So it's known that the rate uh, is the correct rate if you multiply by these uh, two powers of n and log n, but the, the, the existence of a limit is open so far. And this may also work uh, for the other uh, strange dimension uh, where you have a different scaling, which is uh, d equal one. And in this case, uh, the limit is known to exist for any p strictly larger than one half, but there is still an open case. Actually, for p smaller than one half is also known by Bart and Bordenave. So just to mention another open problem is this one. So you take the matching on the, on the interval, but the cost is a concave cost. So you have cost, which is distance to the power of one half. So we know that the rate, uh, the correct rate is this one, as n goes to infinity, but we don't know the existence of the limit. So if you, have, if you happen to be able to solve this one of these two problems, you can immediately also solve the TSP problem using this argument. Anyway, not all the bipartite COPs uh, uh, exhibit uh, these strange rates in small dimensions. For example, the, the minimum spanning tree does not exhibit uh, this, uh, this rate. So it's an interesting problem also to understand uh, what type of COPs uh, have this uh, strange behavior and what type uh, of problems do not exhibit uh, this strange uh, behavior in small dimensions. Okay, so finally, let, let me just uh, give a statement of our uh, result. So our result uh, combines uh, these ideas, but uh, with the other techniques we developed so far for the, for the optimal transport matching problem. And we're able to prove that in dimension larger or equal than three, and for any p finally between zero and d, so like in the classical additive functional theory, if you take uh, IID points, uh, red and blue points, uniformly distributed on a bounded, uh, now we need some assumption, connected for sure domain, because otherwise you have the, the intervals. And also we need the C2 boundary, so a smooth uh, bounded connected domain, so C2 at least the boundary, then we can prove the BHH theorem in this case as well, okay? So which is a nice uh, result. It does not only apply to the TSP, but also it applies uh, to other, other functions. For example, the, the K bounded degree minimum spanning tree. So you, there are also other, other problems that fall into this, in this, into this theorem, which is essentially the strength is comparable to the, to the original theorem by Barton Bordenave. But we are really able to push uh, uh, again, uh, uh, to higher p's uh, thanks to these uh, optimal transport proofs. So now, just a, a quick uh, mm, slide on the structure of the proof. So because, uh, as usual, this, this theorem builds up upon uh, various contributions. Uh, we try to mix together several ideas already, say, in the literature, but also some new ones, because uh, these are different problems than just the matching. So for example, we need to start uh, from the case of a cube and a uniform density. And in this case, uh, we just need to establish the existence of the limit, uh, so this uh, beta constant. And we use, again, subadditivity, but now we combine with optimal transport tools. So we need to be, uh, we are better than Bart and Bordenave because we rely on this optimal transport interpretation, which is not immediate because the TSP is not uh, an optimal transport problem. And then we move to, then as a sort of a general machinery, but we, we, we already imply, employed in dimension two, we are able to, extend in dimension larger than two, so we, we move to densities, but we don't have the limit, we just have an asymptotic upper bound, which we believe to be sharp. Then we move to domains, uh, and we use a Whitney type decomposition that we used also with Ambrosio and, uh, and Michael in dimension two. And finally, we are able to, to move to uniform density also on domains. So this is a, so a way to interpret the, the, the various steps because each step uh, requires uh, so to borrow some ideas from the matching uh, literature essentially. So just a, a quick question, a quick uh, slide on the key step, which is uh, the, the, the subadditivity argument uh, in the cube. So let's say that we are working in the cube. What was the issue? In the previous picture, as I told you, the issue is due to these various error terms that we get from the intermediate scales. And now what we do, we use Capelli's uh, argument. So essentially its argument is not really, so the one of building, uh, uh, um, building a, a, a cycle, using a cycle only on the reds and the matching. It works in general, essentially, not only for the square in dimension two or so on. So 
we just pick up uh, his argument and we say, okay, if we can bound uh, the TSP between the two sets of M points uh, with uh, the TSP only on the red points and the matching problem. And what is nice here? It's nice that uh, for the non-bipartite problem, we can essentially use uh, the theory of the, the additive Euclidean function theory. While for the matching problem, we think of the matching cost as an optimal transport cost. So we can get the best from the two theories, essentially. And the best, what I mean? I mean that uh, for the optimal transport problem, so this is really the best you can get from the additive function theory, so just take it as for granted. Now, for the optimal transport problem, we don't use uh, the trivial bound, which is essentially what also Barton and Bordenave did. So you have n points and n points, uh, and you match, uh, and you say that this is the diameter to the power t times uh, the number of points. Okay, these are not probability measures, but you can normalize with one over m the trivial bound for optimal transport. We can hope to get something better when you know that the points, uh, or better, the measures are density. Because it's known, uh, if you want, there are many interpretations of this inequality, say in terms of, uh, of uh, Benamoubrini formula and so on, you can bound uh, the Wasserstein distance uh, of order p to the power p between two smooth densities in terms of the negative Sobolev norm. But you require uh, to have at least uh, one of the two densities which is uh, strictly bounded from below. Okay, you have this nice inequality, which is much better. So can we, now we need to, to bound this term here. So you will say, oh, you are, you are uh, in trouble because you just need to use this one. These are not densities. Well, but we want to interpolate between the two, and this is uh, also what we did uh, with Luigi and uh, Federico Stra for the uh, p equal two, d equal two case, but more generally, you want to interpolate between the two. So uh, an, ex an example of the proposition, actually, we use more sophisticated results than this, but you can interpolate in the sense that if, uh, if you have a smooth density, and uh, you, uh, you need to transport from a smooth density to a density, to a measure which is a piece of bad uh, uh, points uh, and a small uh, uh, density, you can bound uh, in this term. So this is a sort of interpolation inequality between the two. And of course, you have some requirements on the domain because you need to uh, use uh, Poincaré inequalities uh, or Sobolev embeddings actually in the domain. Now, this is not really the solution because uh, we're still dealing with points. Uh, the, in the TSP problem, you cannot uh, really put densities. At least we don't know how to put uh, a relaxation where you have densities, uh, continuous densities. For the matching problem, you, you are really close to the optimal transport, so you can, you can put densities. So the solution for us uh, is actually to, to preliminarily, so before we do all these uh, subadditivity arguments and so on, we take away a fraction of points that are uniformly distributed, and so we use them like a reservoir of, uh, of good points which are uniformly spread around. And this helps us essentially to enter into the regime of this type of inequalities. And if you do the computations, uh, what happens is that you are forced to take uh, p strictly smaller than d. So we cannot really go above d for the moment. So in conclusion, we have a lot of uh, open questions, but perhaps the most important one uh, is the case uh, of p larger or equal than d. So because we know that the rate uh, is still uh, this one, the one you would expect, uh, but we are not able to, to prove the limit. Well, for the matching problem, since the matching is, uh, if you relax the matching at the optimal transport immediately, we can, we can really move uh, to, to any P larger or equal than D. Of course, uh, there are plenty of uh, other problems. Uh, for example, uh, uh, like it was also mentioned in, uh, in Alessio's uh, uh, talk, right? All these results uh, are nice if you restrict to a bounded region. So what happens in many cases, uh, you have densities which are, for example, a Gaussian density. So you have unbounded support. Uh, so it would be interesting to extend these results to unbounded supports, like for example, Gaussian distributions, which is not uh, immediate uh, uh, so far, how to do it. Okay, so let me conclude that these are some uh, results, but in particular, these are results from the statistical physics literature too, which is very interesting to, to explore because they have many, many ideas. Okay, thanks. Thank you very much. Are there questions, comments? Thank you. Um, so would, would you say that the primary obstacle to getting an explicit constant is that the constant comes from this um, computational complexity theory for the traveling salesman problem, or is there some other uh, <laughs> 
okay, let's say it, it should not come really from computational complexity because uh, for the matching problem, the matching problem is polynomial, but still the constant is explicit essentially only on the p equal d equal uh, two. In that case, it's one of two pi. In the other case, it's, uh, it's not known. While, for example, for the for the minimum spanning tree, there are explicit formulas, but the, also the minimum spanning tree is polynomial. So it's, it may be partially true, but I'm not sure it is completely true. And also, if you move to the so-called mean field version of these problems, where the weights are just the IAD random variables, there are lot, lots of explicit formulas due to Parisi and uh, collaborators, essentially. So I'm, no, I don't know, I'm not sure about that. I, it might be a hint, but uh, so I would not push uh, so many energies to find uh, an explicit formulas for these constants. Uh, I see it's very tricky. And then in, the, in the case where, um, where d equals to two, where we know the limiting explicit constant, do you know if there are any finite sample results? Well, uh, our results uh, are, uh, you can write down explicitly also some rates of convergence, but we don't know ex the exact rates of convergence. Now the, the explicit formulas for finite n, uh, no, I don't think we have them. While in the mean field case, uh, there are some results also for finite n. Uh, no, the best you can get so far is uh, explicit rates of convergence, but uh, these are not sharp. We believe that these are, should not be sharp so far what we have. Okay, thanks. More questions, comments? Okay. Are the results of the distance with negative power? Yeah, I'm checking with the student. It should be, <laughs> so there's a threshold, there's a, new, a threshold again that minus d. So as long as you are uh, with p between uh, minus d and zero, it's fine, you get the same rate. Uh, while the below minus d, the expectation is plus infinity. So you get uh, really that uh, these, uh, these variables have no finite expectation. This is the maximizing. The yes, yes, you maximize. When you're negative, you maximize. So the points are still uh, close together. Yeah. Thanks. So this D appears in both sides, uh, both in positive and negative. Yeah. We have time for more questions. OK, so if not, let's thank Dario again. And we'll So we can continue with the second talk by Giacomo De Palma. He will talk about the quantum Wasserstein distance of order one. Thank you. Okay, so good afternoon to everybody. It's always nice to be back in Pisa where I spent so many years. So I thank all the organizers of the conference for the kind invitation. So in, uh, in this talk, uh, I will present you a quantum version of the Wasserstein distance, distance of order one, and a quantum version of optimal mass transport, and uh, uh, an application of this distance to quantum machine learning. And you can find uh, most of the results that I will present in these two papers, like the first paper is uh, like presents the, the distance, and uh, the second paper uh, presents the application to, to quantum machine learning, and these are papers with, with Dario here and uh, with uh, I, the group I was part in when I was at MIT. Okay, so first like there, there have been uh, several generalizations of uh, optimal mass transport to the quantum setting and the reason why there have been uh, several generalizations is that uh, it is not possible to like keep uh, all the properties uh, of the optimal transport that you have in the classical setting. So you have to decide uh, what uh, you want to keep uh, and what you are willing to give up. And uh, depending on this choice that you make, uh, you can get uh, different like, possibilities uh, with different kinds of application. So uh, I don't have the time to present like all of the applications that have been proposed, so I will focus on the one that I have uh, I've been working on, a and then I will say like what are the characteristic of uh, this generalization? What is that we we wanted to keep? So first, like here, there is no, no need to introduce uh, the, the Wasserstein distance in the in the classical setting. I will uh, focus on the Wasserstein distance of, of order one, and uh, the the classical uh, 
model that you can keep in mind, which is the closest to what will be the, the quantum generalization, is uh, the set uh, of uh, bit strings uh, endowed with the Hamming distance. So the Hamming distance is a distance that uh, counts the number of different bits. Uh, and then you can consider probability distributions or on the set of bit strings. Uh, and of course, you can define uh, an optimal transport distance uh, on the space of, of such probability distributions. And of course, uh, if you want to be slightly more general, you can replace bits uh, with uh, symbols which can take the values, uh, okay? And of course, as all of you know, uh, like a fundamental property of the Wasserstein distance of order one is that it depends only on the difference between the probability measures uh, and uh, you can express it through a norm uh, that you can define on the space of like on the differences between probability measures and, and the span of those differences, of course, the space of signed measures with uh, zero total mass. And this fact that you can uh, like derive uh, the like the Wasserstein distance over the one from a norm will be crucial for our quantum generalization. Okay. So first, I'm not assuming that you are familiar with quantum mechanics. So let me first uh, present uh, what uh, I mean with, with qubits and, and qubits and quantum system. So first, uh, any quantum system has an associated Hilbert space. And uh, if we consider a single qubit, the Hilbert space is just uh, CD. And it will be useful to consider in CD the, the canonical basis. And I will uh, label the vectors of the canonical basis uh, in, in this way here. So we have a label, which is a number from 1 to d. That's the label that I call here x. And then uh, like the usual notation in physics is that you, you put uh, the, the label for the vector inside these uh, two brackets, like, uh, like the, the vertical bar and the like right angle bracket. And this is just a notation. So you have a label and with the Inside these brackets, this label just means we have a vector in the Hilbert space. Then this is a single qubit. If we want to consider like several qubits, we take the nth tensor power of CD. What does it mean? So if we want to find a base, a, an orthonormal basis of this Hilbert space, this will just be indexed by the strings of. Spiacente, non ho capito. <laughs> so the, this basis will just be labeled by the strings uh, of uh, n symbols that can take, each of those can take the values. So for example, we can associate, for the case of qubits, we can associate uh, to each bit string of n bits uh, a vector of the canonical basis of n tensor copies of C2. And then what is uh, a state uh, of the, the quantum system? This is the counterpart of a uh, probability distribution. And it will just be a positive semi-definite linear operator acting on the Hilbert space uh, with trace one. So positive semi-definite is for the positivity of probability and trace one is that uh, all the probabilities have to come up to one. And among all the, the quantum states, the ones that are diagonal in the canonical basis play a key role because, of course, you can easily associate to those states a probability distribution on the, like, on the set of the vectors of the canonical basis, which here are labeled by bit strings. So the states diagonal in the canonical basis are in a one-to-one -one correspondence with the probability distributions on the uh, strings made of n symbols that can take the values each. So we have generalized the distributions. Let's now generalize uh, functions. We replace uh, a function defined on the set of bit strings uh, with uh, a quantum observ observable, which is uh, just a Hermitian matrix uh, that acts uh, on the Hilbert space of the system. And similarly to the classical case, the expectation value of um, the observable H on the state rho will just be given by the trace of rho h. Now let me introduce what kind of, like what are the easy manipulations that you can do on a quantum state. 
So you can, uh, the, the elementary operation is uh, conjugating uh, the, the state uh, with uh, a unitary matrix uh, which acts uh, on a few qubits, so usually it's one or two. So this will be a unitary operator acting on the two qubits, tensored with the identity acting on the remaining qubits. And uh, then, uh, like when you, in the classical setting, uh, like uh, one of the most important distances uh, on the set of probability distribution is the total variation distance. And uh, this has a quantum counterpart, which is the trace distance, which is just equal to one half uh, the trace norm of the difference between the states and plays exactly the same role as total variation in the classical setting. And here I recall that the trace norm is just the sum of the singular values. Okay, so after this uh, like fast introduction to quantum mechanics, uh, let me move on uh, to define uh, the optimal transport uh, in the quantum setting uh, and uh, like what you wanted to keep uh, in, in our version of quantum optimal transport. So the first thing that I have to say is that in the classical setting, uh, like we already start uh, with a distance on the metric space that in, in the case I'm considering is the Hamming distance. Uh, that will be a distance between uh, probability distributions that are Dirac deltas that are concentrated on a single point. So the, the quantum uh, counterpart of Dirac deltas are the so-called pure states, which are uh, projectors of rank one. And uh, in the quantum setting, uh, we, we lack uh, uh, like a counterpart of the Hamming distance because we can easily define a Hamming distance between uh, the projectors on the vectors of the canonical basis we can because we can associate those vectors to bit strings but if we have uh, projectors on vectors which are which do not belong to the canonical basis so which are combinations of several basis vectors there is no obvious counterpart of the Hamming distance and this is one thing we want to provide and the second thing is more or less the same reason why we introduce optimal transport in the classical setting, that we, we do not want to consider all the Dirac deltas distributions equivalent. We want to consider like, them to be closer if the, their centers are closer in the metric space and farther away if their centers are farther away. And in particular, for bit strings, it means that if we, we flip a single bit, this should be considered as a small change because it's one bit uh, in, or out of n bits, and we would like a similar property in the quantum setting, so a, a small a change that acts on uh, only a few qubits should be considered a small change. So this is what we want to have, and moreover, we would like something that uh, recover, like since we have seen that diagonal states are in a one-to-one -one correspondence with vectors, so, sorry, with probability distributions so on bit strings, we would like to recover the classical transport distance for at least for these states. So these are the requirements, and uh, like here is uh, how we def yes. No, like the metric space is the set of all the strings, and the distance is the Hamming distance that counts the number of different bits. We don't care about the order exactly, it's permutation invariant. Okay, so we can come to our definition of the quantum Wasserstein distance of order one. So it, it's slightly different from how we introduce like the distance in the classical setting, but uh, so we say that uh, two quantum states are neighboring if they coincide after we discard a qubit, that means after we marginalize over the state of that qubit. And of course, you can give the same definition in a classical setting where you say that two probability distributions on bit strings are neighboring if they coincide when you marginalize a suitable bit. And then you notice that in the classical setting, the Wasserstein distance over order one between any two neighboring probability distributions is at most one. So we impose this 
constraint also in the quantum setting. So we want to impose that neighboring states have distance at most one. So I said that in the classical setting, the Wasserstein one is induced by a norm. So we want to impose the same requirement in the quantum setting, and we want a distance that's imposed uh, like that, that derives from a norm on the set of uh, traceless uh, Hermitian matrices. And then if the distance uh, is induced by a norm, we have that uh, all the differences between neighboring states should belong to the unit ball of such norm. And then the idea is the following. OK, if we just take the convex hull of all the differences between neighboring states and declare this object to be the unit ball of the norm, then we have a norm with the required properties. And this will be the maximum, like the convex hull will be the minimum ball for which we get the maximum norm. And so this will be the maximum norm that assigns distance at most one to any couple of neighboring states. And actually, you can, like, as uh, you will know, you can compute the Wasserstein one distance with a linear program. In like, this quantum version, can be computed by a semi definite program. So there are efficient algorithms to compute the, the distance that scale roughly as the cube of the dimension of the Hilbert space, which is the size of the matrices which are involved to describe a quantum state. OK, so let's check uh, that uh, what we have just defined uh, has the properties that we wanted to have. So first requirement was to recover the classical setting. And uh, actually, you can figure out uh, that uh, you could have defined the classical Wasserstein distance over the one exactly in that way, starting from neighboring distributions. And this implies that. Uh, the quantum distance that we have defined exactly recovers the classical Wasserstein one distance for the quantum states that are diagonal in the canonical basis, and then they correspond to probability distribution on the set of bit strings. And in particular, for the states which are projectors onto the vectors of the canonical basis, we recover the Hamming distance because this is what Wasserstein one does for the arc deltas. So we have a quantum version of the Hamming distance. Then if we want to compare this distance with total variation, that is trace distance in the quantum setting, we get exactly what we have in the classical case. So the transport distance always lies between total variation and the number of qubits times total variation. And then we also have the required robustness with respect to local operations. So if we have two quantum states that coincide after we discard the qubits in some subset A of all the qubits, what happens is that their distance is upper bounded by twice the number of qubits that we have discarded. So here there is this factor of two that is will not be there in the classical setting. We will just have here the number of bits that need to be marginalized. And uh, uh, actually this comes from the fact that the, the pure states in the quantum setting are much more than the Dirac deltas in the, in the classical setting. OK. So we have, uh, like, let's keep going on exploring the properties of this Wasserstein distance that we have defined. So a fundamental quantity in, uh, in probability is the relative entropy or pullback Leibler divergence. And this has a quantum counterpart that is called the quantum relative entropy. And uh, is given by like the relative entropy between state rho and state omega is given by the trace of rho times logarithm of rho minus logarithm of omega, assuming that uh, omega has two rank. And this quantity, like for the applications we are interested in, is uh, fundamental in uh, statistical mechanics because the relative entropy of a given state with respect to a Gibbs distribution is easy to estimate and bound. Now, 
the relative entropy is related to the phase distance by the so-called Pinsker's inequality, which takes the same form in the classical and the quantum setting. And this says that the, the total variation is upper bounded by the square root of one half of the relative entropy. Now, in, uh, if we introduce uh, the Wasserstein one distance so with respect to the Hamming distance, it's possible to improve uh, the Pinsker's inequality and get some version that uh, is, uh, in some sense, uh, intensive in the sense that it's a function of the normalized Wasserstein distance divided by, that's the Wasserstein distance divided by the number of bits, and the normalized relative entropy, which is the relative entropy divided by the number of bits. And we have been able to prove the, exactly the same inequality for our quantum version of the distance, so on the Left hand side, we have uh, the normalized distance between a generic state and a product state, which is the same as a product distribution. And this is upper bounded by the square root of one half the normalized relative entropy between the generic state and the product state. And this inequality has applications in uh, quantum statistical mechanics for the study of uh, Gibbs measures. And of course, in that case, uh, we need some generalization of this where the generic product state uh, has to be replaced by uh, a Gibbs measure of, of the system, the Gibbs measure of the system of interest. Okay, so you know that you can uh, have uh, a dual formulation of the Wasserstein one distance, which is uh, in terms of the Lipschitz constant of functions. And in particular, you know, you can express the distance between the two distributions as the maximum of the difference in expectation values over functions that have a Lipschitz constant that are bounded by one. So also in the quantum setting, we can have something similar. So we can define a quantum generalization of the Lipschitz constant, which uh, is the following. First, we need to define something that quantifies the dependence of an observable on a single qubit. That's what I call the I, derivative of h with respect to i, which is the index of the qubit. And this goes as follows. So we consider, we, we consider the observable h, and we subtract from the observable uh, a generic observable that uh, does not act on the qubit i, so it's the identity on i tensored with something else acting on the remaining qubits. Then we take the operator norm of this, and we minimize over all the possible subtractions, and then there is a factor of two to match the classical setting. And this quantifies the dependence of the observable on, on the qubit i, and then we just uh, maximize this quantity over all the qubits and define this object as the quantum Lipschitz constant of the observable H. This looks a bit different from the classical definition of Lipschitz constant, but then you can check that if you choose, uh, like, if you use this definition for a function uh, defined on bit strings, uh, you get back exactly the usual definition of Lipschitz constant uh, with respect to the Hamming distance. So it is a proper quantum generalization of the Lipschitz constant. And also in the quantum setting, we can express our quantum Wasserstein distance over order one in a dual formulation, which involves this Lipschitz constant. And this is exactly the, so the, the distance between rho and sigma is exactly the maximum in the difference in the expectation value on rho and sigma over all the observable which have Lipschitz constant upper bounded by one. And I, if you remember, I told that this uh, quantum uh, Wasserstein distance can be computed with a semi-definite program. And uh, this uh, equivalent expression here exactly provides the dual of the semi-definite program that's given by the primal definition of the Wasserstein distance. Okay, so in the classical setting, uh, there, there are like several uh, kind of inequalities, for example, McDiarmid's inequalities that say that uh, smooth functions of several independent random variables are essentially constant. 
So we wanted to look at uh, whether we can generalize this to the quantum setting, and we found that uh, we, we can. So the, the, the um, easiest results are for the quantum version of the uniform distribution. And uh, so we consider uh, some observ a generic observable H, and we managed to prove that uh, most of the eigenvalues of H, they lie in some inter... Okay, let's assume that H is traceless such that the average of the eigenvalues is zero. So we, uh, we, you can always make it traceless by subtracting a suitable constant, of course. So we, we managed to prove that most of the eigenvalues of H lie in some interval that has a size proportional to the Lipschitz constant of H times the square root of the number of qubits. And more precisely, the diffraction of the eigenvalues that are farther away than n times delta from the average is upper bounded by e to the minus 2n delta square over the square of the Lipschitz constant. And this is the same as the, the classical Gaussian concentration inequality for uh, independent uh, random variables that can take a finite number of values. And then uh, you can may wonder what happens if you have a product state uh, which is uh, uh, not the uniform distribution. And for like generic product states, we have only been able to prove a quadratic concentration, which is uh, this inequality here. So the, the variance uh, of a generic observable on uh, a generic uh, product uh, measure is upper bounded by the number of qubits times the square of the Lipschitz constant of the observable. So this implies quadratic concentration. Okay, and actually these inequalities have application in limiting the performance of quantum computers in the sense that you can prove that if you apply only simple operations, then you can only generate state that still satisfies these concentration inequalities. And uh, it turns out that uh, some, uh, task, uh, some tasks would require states that are uh, not concentrated, that are the, so they are not compatible with these concentration properties, and then you can prove that uh, uh, with uh, simple operations, you are not allowed to solve such problems. Okay, last property that I will show you, like a fundamental quantity in information theory is the Shannon entropy that has the quantum counterpart, which is the von Neumann entropy. So the entropy of a state rho is uh, minus the trace of rho, rho times the logarithm of rho, and this is uh, the Shannon entropy of the probability distribution associated with the eigenvalues of rho. And it, it quantifies the uncertainty in the, in the state rho. So in the classical setting, you can prove a continuity bound for the Shannon entropy of n bits in terms of the Wasserstein distance of order one between the, the associated distributions. And in a quantum setting, we have been able to prove a continuity bound which is almost identical to the classical one, so it's this one here. On the left hand side, we have the normalized uh, difference in the entropies, and this is bounded by the binary entropy function of the normalized uh, Wasserstein distance plus uh, the normalized Wasserstein distance times the logarithm of d square minus one, where I recall that d is the number of possible symbols. And okay, here we have like this is the binary entropy function that you will almost surely. No, and the, like the classical bound, this is a paper, like the classical bound has been proved quite recently by Yuri Polyansky. It's identical to this one here. The only difference is that there is uh, D in place of D square. And this factor of two that appears here more or less has the same origin as the factor of two that I showed you a few slides ago about the robustness with respect to local operation. Okay, so let me now switch to the second part of this talk and uh, the, um, present the application of this distance in quantum machine learning. So what is quantum machine learning about? 
it's uh, about how quantum computers can help for machine learning problems. So the idea is that we, say, we encode the input of a machine learning problem in uh, the state of some qubits, and then we, we process those qubits with uh, these elementary operations that act on, on few qubits, and then we measure the final state and try to get an, an answer in, in the end. And uh, so why should uh, this have uh, any potential advantage over what we can do with classical computers? Like the idea is that the operations that we can easily apply on a quantum state uh, are unitary operations that where the, the unitary matrix uh, is uh, sparse. So sparse means that each row has only order one elements which are non zero. And the point is that uh, this can be done uh, much faster than uh, the matrix multiplication on, in the classical setting because the, like, the dimension of the Hilbert space uh, grows exponentially with the number of qubits. So we can uh, apply to a quantum state a sparse uh, 2 to the n times 2 to the n unitary matrix uh, in a time which is only polynomial in the number of qubits uh, rather than exponential as, as the dimension would be. And then the, like, the interesting part is determining whether you can uh, apply this, uh, this power of making this operation to make something useful. Okay. So what uh, I will uh, talk about uh, in uh, this presentation is uh, a machine learning, like a protocol in machine learning that is called the Generative Adversarial Network. So what's a Generative Adversarial Network? Uh, the idea is that you have uh, samples from some unknown probability distribution and from those samples, so you want to find out what the distribution was and generate new samples. So for example, uh, you have uh, pictures of, of people, which you consider as samples from the probability distribution of the faces of all the people in the world. And then you want some algorithm that generates uh, new faces of people, which do not belong to the samples that you have already provided to the algorithm. And the idea is that you will have some parametric probability distribution with uh, a, a lot of parameters. And uh, you will uh, try to, like, the, the, the algorithm is made by, by two parts. You will have a generator that has this parametric, pro tunable parametric probability distribution. And his goal is to train uh, the parameters to, like, such that the distribution is as close as possible to the target one. And the idea is to train the generator against a discriminator, which has the goal of determining whether a given sample is a true sample coming from the true distribution or a fake sample coming from the generator. So the generator is trained to fool the discriminator, and the discriminator is trained to fool the, the generator. And there is some positive feedback mechanism that converges in, like, after um, in principle, infinite number of iteration converges to the generator that generates exactly the, the true distribution. And actually, these are some examples of what you can do with this kind of algorithms. So all these faces of people here, the, these people are not real. They do not exist. They are artificially generated photos. OK. so. How is this related to quantum mechanics? So there is a quantum version of uh, generative adversarial networks where instead of learning uh, a probability distribution, you want to learn a quantum state of which you have some copies at disposal. So this can be seen in two ways, the application of this kind of protocol. There is the truly quantum setting where you actually have a quantum state that can be uh, physical piece of matter that you want to reproduce in some way. And then there is the like classical setting where your quantum state is actually like diagonal in the canonical basis and then corresponds to some classical probability distribution. And you want to check whether a quantum computer is able to learn such a distribution easier in an easier way than a classical computer. 
So also in the quantum setting, uh, the, the framework will be the same, like we have the, the two state that we call sigma that we want to reproduce, and we have a, a generator and a discriminator, so that the generator has some parametric quantum operation that generates some quantum state, and it, it will try to generate a state that is as close as possible to the target state, while the discriminator has the goal of determining whether a given state is the two state, that the target state, or the fake state generated by the generator. Okay, so why optimal mass transfer here? So the, the, the reason is the same that you have in the classical setting, that if you try to discriminate the, the, the fake from the two state with uh, the, the quantum counterpart of total variation, you will find that uh, all the, let's say, like for, if you think to the photograph setting, you are close in total variation to the empirical distribution only if you are choosing directly pictures that belong to the, to the samples. Otherwise, you will be like uh, on a disjoint support with, uh, with respect to the empirical distribution that you have from your samples. And uh, having your algorithm just uh, uh, choosing uh, a, a random example and outputting this example is exactly what you do not want to happen. So it's not a good idea to use total variation in this setting. And this is why you would like to have some kind of distance uh, that uh, can be like non-maximum non also for uh, like distributions that are different Dirac deltas and that's why optimal transport is useful. Also, like in the one of the other issues that you have, uh, if you like, because in the quantum setting, not all the states are perfect, like not all different states are perfectly distinguishable. So, in principle, you would be able to train uh, a discriminator using the, the quantum version of total variation. But then, the, in some sense, the classical issue that you had with total variation comes out anyway. And what happens is that the in principle, it's true that you can train the, the quantum network, but uh, the, the gradient of your, your quantifier of the distance between the states uh, with respect to your parameters becomes exponentially small with respect to the number of qubits. And then, in practice, you will not be able to train. So the idea is, uh, OK, let's use uh, the, the quantum uh, optimal transport distance in place of total variation, and here is uh, how it works. So I said you, we have a generator and a discriminator, so the generator generates some parametric state that we call rho, and the discriminator, to like discriminate uh, the, the true from the fake state, actually measures uh, a quantum observable on such states, and for what concerns this talk, measures, you, you can interpret measures as uh, finds the expectation value, so compute the trace with the state, which can be done with uh, a few samples. And uh, the, the, the point is that if uh, on, the, on, the, on the constraint that you impose of this observable that you measure, because if you, if you bound the operator norm of this observable, then if you maximize over the possible observable that you can measure, we will find out the total variation. While uh, if uh, you impose uh, that the observable has a Lipschitz constant uh, at more upper bounded by one, when you optimize over all the observable, you find out the Wasserstein distance. So the discriminator will choose, will have a parametric observable that has a Lipschitz constant uh, upper bounded by one, and uh, he will optimize this, will tune the parameters of this observable to maximize the difference uh, in the the expectation value on the true and on the fake state. And ideally, if the, the discriminator was able to generate any possible observable, he would get the faster same distance between the states. And the, the generator, or the contrary, like tunes the parameter of the state to minimize the, this difference in expectation values that the generator, sorry, that the discriminator is finding. So the generator and discriminator are trained one to fool the other, and 
there is the, the positive feedback mechanism I was describing before, which in the end converges, like if everything is done ideally, it converges when the generator is generating a state which is identical to the, to the target state. Okay, so we run uh, some uh, numerics uh, with these algorithms. And uh, with, uh, like for some families of quantum states, uh, we, we, um, some families of quantum target state, we found exactly this, uh, the advantage that we were expecting. So you see, you can see in this plot, uh, like the, on the X axis, the number of qubits and on the Y axis, uh, the size of the gradient of the cost function in a logarithmic scale. So the blue line is uh, with total variation Sorry, the blue line is uh, with the Wasserstein distance, while the orange line is with total variation. And here you see that with total variation, you have uh, a gradient that vanishes exponentially with the number of qubits because you see a line there, a line with some slope. While uh, with uh, the Wasserstein distance, you see no significant decrease uh, of the gradient as you increase the number of qubits. Okay, so I can finally come to the conclusion. So we have presented this uh, quantum version of the Wasserstein distance of order one with some application to quantum machine learning. So what can, what has to be done now? Like one question is whether it's possible to see this distance as part of a larger family of Wasserstein distances of order P, which is an open problem because we heavily relied on uh, having the distance induced by a norm, which is not true for all the other Wasserstein two distances. Then there are applications in quantum statistical mechanics and in the equivalence between uh, the microcanonical and canonical statistical ensembles. We have, you can find the, like some of these applications in, in this paper. Then there are the limitations to the capabilities of quantum computers. I, you can find more about that in uh, this other paper here. And then other possible applications are like to study the robustness of uh, quantum algorithms for machine learning with respect to the perturbations in the input, where you can use the transport distance to quantify the size of the perturbation. Or uh, there can be applications in quantum error correction, where more or in the same way, more or less, the, the humming distance uh, plays a role in the design of classical error correcting codes. And also there can be applications in rated distortion theory where you, the goal, like you want to design a protocol that transmits a quantum state where some imperfection is allowed in the recovery. And of course the distance is there to quantify the quality of the recovery. And finally we have a, recently with Dario, a generalization of this distance uh, where the number of qubits is infinite, so a uh, quantum spin system so in, on infinite lattices. So this is all I wanted to tell you. Thanks for the attention. So thank you very much, Giacomo. Uh, questions, comments? Um, uh, thank you for your interesting talk. Could you go back to the um, the plot you had on the previous slide? So um, I am just baffled that you can implement a GAN on four qubits, like in the first the first point of the plot, right? Is do you really have two generative adversarial networks playing against each other that each have are somehow implemented on two qubits each? I, yes. I, yes. Really? Yes. It's not like you. And, and what is the data that they are working with? What's the, sorry? The data, like if you have the GANs that are looking at images, surely you need at least like 256 bits to store an image. Ah, uh, yeah, right? sure. No, then that's much simpler than that because if you have four qubits, then you, you can't store much data in, in those. I see, but it's, so it's, it's the, 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 the data takes four qubits of space. It's not like the neural net on either side only has- No, no, like- or something. This plot uh, is made on a training uh, on a, like the target state uh, is a very simple state. Uh, so the, the state we trained the network on to 
test the capability of this network is the a pure state which is a projector on a vector which is a, a linear combination of the all zero string and the all one string. So this, uh, if I can use the blackboard or the whiteboard, is the state that we write uh, like. This is a linear combination between n copies of zero and n copies of one, and then you want something with norm one, and then you divide to the norm, and uh, and you consider the projector on, on this vector. So we trained the, the network on that, like we trained a parametric circuit to reproduce that state, and, and and that's what we got. That if you if you use total variation, you don't you don't succeed, you get stuck, and if you use the transport distance, then you succeed. But it's a, uh, like, if you want, like, the reason why quantum computers can be potentially useful is that they are hard to simulate on a classical computer. So uh, simulating uh, 200 uh, qubits uh, on a classical computer is uh, completely not feasible. And then there's, like, so far, no way to check how this would behave on 200 qubits, unfortunately. Great. So for, for your plot, I mean, are you using like a Bohmian simulation of the quantum computer? Does your lab actually have access to 14 qubits? No, this is a laptop simulation of a... Okay, okay cool. Thank you. So as for the dual problem that you mentioned with the one Lipschitz uh, function, right? So. Yes. Do you have any characterization of H? So the maximal uh, or the optimal potential, do you have some kind of back one of a non-divergence? So there is a characterization, but it's not nice to write, and we didn't find it particularly interesting, but I can show you it more explicitly, and maybe you, you can think of something. No, but just to know if, so it, it, is, it is somewhere. Uh, we don't know whether it's unique, for example. Ah, you don't know it's, it's unique, okay. I, it must exist because everything is compact. Yes. But we don't know whether it's unique or not. Thank you. More questions? Okay, so I think uh, we can Thank you, Giacomo, again, and go for the coffee break. Thank you. Okay, so the next talk is uh, from Chiara Rigoni from Vienna. She will talk about obtained spaces, Dirichlet spaces, with the distribution value lower bounds on the Ricci curvature. Thank you. So first of all, thanks a lot to the organizers for the invitation and for the possibility to present these results here. So what we what I present today is the class of thin spaces, which are the Richelieu spaces in which it's possible and meaningful to, um, to define a synthetic lower bound on the Richie curvature, and this lower bound is given in terms of a distribution. This is a, a joint work, a work based on a, on a joint work with Matthias Erbar, Theo Sturm, and uh, Luca Tamandini. So, uh, first of all, I would like to okay. first of all, I would like to start with some motivational examples. So, uh, what we would like is to enlarge our theory of, uh, of CD spaces, in which uh, there is a way to define a synthetic uh, lower bound in terms of a constant. To um, so to, to the case in which, as we said, we have a distribution. So, in particular, we would like to inclu include these uh, these um, examples. Uh, so we start with a smooth Riemannian manifold, and uh, let us suppose that we have a way to find a lower bound on, on the Ricci curvature, but this is a given, first of all, in terms of a continuous but unbounded function. Second example is a, in the case in which this bound is in given in terms of a locally unbounded function, which is in LP, for some P which is greater than the topological dimension of the manifold over two. And the third example is the case in which we have a Riemannian manifold with the boundary, and for which the second fundamental form of the boundary is bounded from below, 
by some LP function, LP with respect to the boundary measure, and P is larger than N minus one. So let's start with the setting, which is the one of the Dirichlet forms. So uh, we, we, we fix a quasi-regular strongly local Dirichlet space, which is a triple given by a topological losing, losing space, a um, Borel measure with full topological support, and a quasi-regular strongly local Dirichlet form on L2, with, and we denote by calligraphic F the domain of the form. So to be in the same page, I would like just to uh, recall what is a Dirichlet form. So a Dirichlet form is a non-negative symmetric bilinear form, uh, such that the domain is a dense subset of L2. Then we require that the, the domain equipped with the, this uh, uh, scalar product, which is given by a, a term which involves so, the L2 norm, plus uh, the, um, the, the form compute against F and G. This we require, to, we, want to be, uh, we want to have an Hilbert space, and the third property is a, um, so a, a, a contraction property, meaning that if we start with a function which is in the domain of the form and we cut it from below by zero and from above by one, we, we want that this element is still a, an, ele an element in the domain of the form and the, um, the Dirichlet form computed in, uh, in this uh, element is not larger than the, 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 the initial Dirichlet form. Moreover, we require that uh, there exists a carré du champ, which is a symmetric bilinear map, which takes a value in, a, uh, in non the, non the set of non-negative L1 functions, uh, which satisfies the Leibniz rule. And this uh, has the advantage that we can write our Dirichlet forms form as an integral of this uh, L1 function with respect to our uh, measure M and is uh, uh, multiply, multiplied by a factor one half. So once we have this, uh, um, we, have, we said that we want a quasi-regular, strongly local Dirichlet form. Actually, uh, to give the definition of these, uh, of these uh, properties, which are very important, uh, it's, they are a little bit technical, so I would prefer to give you two, uh, the, two the two main examples which are obviously, first of all, the case of the Riemannian manifolds. So we take, uh, for any Riemannian manifold, there is a, a standard way to associate a Dirichlet space, which is given by the manifold, the, okay, obviously, the volume associated to the Riemannian uh, metric tensor. And then we have, as the form, we, so we have, we are, have um, a space which is smooth, so we can uh, compute the gradient of functions, we take the, the norm of, the, of, the, of this element, we squared it, we take the integral with respect to the volume measure, and we have that this is the Dirichlet form whose domain is exactly the Sobolet space. This is always a quasi-regular and strongly local Dirichlet forms, form, and obviously the Carré du Champ is given by the, the, the norm of the gradient of F squared. This is a very basic example. We would like, what we, we do in the next uh, example is to generalize this in the case of metric measure spaces. And this is what uh, it was uh, done uh, in, as a first uh, step by Chiger in 2000 and then uh, by Ambrosio Gilles Savare in 2011. So we start with a complete and separable metric space uh, and we consider on it a non-negative Radon measure M. Uh, we define uh, this uh, functional, which is convex and low and semi-continuous, which is the Chigar energy, by relaxation. So we take any function in uh, L2, and we, we, um, we take the uh, sequence of uh, bounded Lipschitz function, which is approximating F in L2, and then we take this, uh, uh, so the uh, limit of uh, these uh, energies, so, uh, which are formulated in terms of the metric slope of the Lipschitz function, uh, then we take the, okay, the Lim-inf and then the inf among all the sequence approximately our function f. The, the important point is that uh, the sub space associated to the metric measure space, which is exactly the domain of this, uh, this form, is dense in L2. Moreover, uh, we have that uh, for any function which is sub there exists um, the minimal recapper gradient, 
which is the unique element of minimal norm in this uh, set. And so in particular is an L2 function. And we can represent the Chigger energy as the integral, the one over two, the integral of the minimal weak upper gradient squared with respect to the, um, to the reference measure. Very well, so um, now we, we have the, um, another important definition, which, is given, which was given by Gilles in 2012. And uh, so we say that the metric measure space is infinitesimal Hilbertian if this Sobole space is actually an Hilbert space. And this is equivalent to the fact that the Chigger energy is, quadra is a quadratic form on L2. And so in particular, if we have an infinitesimal Hilbertian metric measure space, we have a Dirichlet form which is associated to this uh, space. Moreover, whenever we have that, uh, this is a result proved by Savare in 2013, whenever we have also a um, condition on the curvature of this metric measure space, so we have an RCD K infinity space, the, um, this uh, uh, Chigar energy is actually a strongly local and quasi regular Dirichlet form. So we are exactly in the hypothesis of our constructions. So um, now let's uh, uh, see the main idea uh, behind this definition of time spaces. And our starting point is a fundamental inequality, which is the Bochner inequality. It's very important because we know that in a smooth Riemannian manifold, the fact that the Ricci curvature of the manifold is bounded from below by some constant k is equivalent to the validity uh, everywhere of this inequality for, uh, for any smooth function f. So uh, in particular, this inequality was generalized in, uh, in the 85 by Bethry and Emery uh, in, a, in a way that, so they formulated this uh, synthetic lower Ricci bound in, uh, in terms of the Dirichlet uh, space. And so uh, this inequality now becomes uh, this inequality which holds almost everywhere and is formulated in terms so, of the gamma two uh, operator, which is the iterated Carré Duchamp, which is greater or equal than K times uh, the Carré Duchamp. So here the key point is, the, is that we would like to replace this uh, constant K by a, a suitable distribution K and to consider so, this inequality in a distributional sense. So uh, here we have uh, the, this integral in which this uh, function phi appears, phi is greater or equal than zero, and it's, uh, it, um, it plays a role to localize the inequality. And here we have that uh, we have k kappa, which is acting exactly against the uh, Carré Duchamp. So uh, since the Carré Duchamp is uh, uh, is, is uh, actually um, it's uh, like having uh, acting it on the uh, Dirichlet uh, form itself. And this, uh, so what we are we want to, to do in the next uh, part of the talk is uh, to understand this uh, object and also to understand which kind of distributions uh, are suitable for this uh, work. So. Um, First of all, what is a distribution is any element in the dual of the domain of the form. An example is uh, given in the case in which we have a locally compact space and uh, the, the Dirichlet form is actually regular. If we take F, any random me measure of finite inter energy integral, this is actually uh, arise, uh, gives a rise um, uh, to a distribution which is given just by integra integrating the quasi-continuous representative of a phi against the Radon measure. So um, now what we do is uh, to associate to each distribution a unique continuous additive functional. And the, the way that we do it, I just uh, briefly mentioned, uh, it is like, uh, is, uh, we, we find it in, in this way. So we have this part in which we have the, so the, the, this uh, continuous additive function at time t is given by this part in which we have the integral between zero and t of this uh, psi against the Brownian motion. And, uh, so, uh, and this psi is obtained, so uh, let's say that the, the generator of the form, uh, this, uh, this operator in which we have the generator of the form, uh, this uh, um, provides a, an isometry between 
the domain of the form and it's dual. So we can find to associate it to any distribution kappa, a unique element psi in such a way that this identity is satisfied. And so this we have here, we have this term involv involving this uh, psi. And then we have another term in which we have the martingale additive functional, which is associated to the Fukushima decomposition. This is a little bit more uh, complicated. So uh, we, again, we see an example in which it's quite easy. And it's the case in which our distribution is actually some uh, nearly borel function in L2. Uh, and this, in this case, our uh, additive uh, functional boils down to this expression in which we have the, fun the function which is integrated again, again, the Brownian motion associated to the Dirichlet form. So this is uh, uh, what we have uh, for the for the perturb for, yeah, for the distribution, and now using this uh, um, continuous additive functional, we can uh, define this uh, taming semigroup using the Feynman Katz formula, and this takes this expression. So we are, here we have the expectation of this object in which, as we we remark that here we have the additive functional that we have just defined. And here we have our function, L2 function, against the, the something which is just related to the fact that we have a Dirichlet form. So um, now, so far, we don't have any other properties on this, uh, uh, on this semigroup. So that's why we introduced the following definition, which is uh, the class of moderate, moderate distributions, which are the distribution for which this, so this expectation of the, just the part involving the continuous additive functional, this is uh, bounded uniformly in time and space. What we gain uh, once we have a moderate distribution is the fact that now we can say that the, our taming semigroup actually defines a strongly continuous and exponentially bounded semigroup on L2. And this is a uh, very good because we know that once we have uh, um, a semigroup with these properties, we can associate uh, a lower bounded closed quadratic form, which is uh, our taming energy. So the, the thing that we did was, uh, uh, just to summarize, we started with the distribution, we associated the continuous additive functional, using the continuous additive functional, we define the taming semigroup, and now we, have, we found a perturbed uh, energy, which is our taming energy. So uh, at this point, uh, we are ready to uh, formulate our uh, main definition, and we say that uh, the Richelieu space is a tame if there exists a moderate distribution, for here, I kept the quasi-local just because I want to uh, point out that actually, so far we gave all this definition in a global sense, but actually we can localize this, uh, this, uh, this, uh, the only definition that we have uh, done, uh, we have given, we can localize them to a quasi-open uh, exhaustion of our uh, set X. And then, uh, we say that so uh, uh, the space is tame if there exists a distribution for which this Bochner inequality holds true. This uh, Bochner inequality, so here we have the, the, the appearance of the perturbed energy, which uh, acts uh, on our Carré Duchamp. And here we have the, this, uh, third, let's say, third order uh, operator because we have the uh, Carré Duchamp acting on the generator of the initial. Um, uh, uh, form. So uh, this in particular, when k, uh, k, kappa is equal to the constant k, boils down to the standard uh, Bochner inequality. Uh, and in this case, we say that the, the Dirichlet space admits a distributional value lower Ricci bound. In particular, like, la as a last result I wanted to mention, is the fact that uh, this, uh, this theorem ensures that uh, the three examples we started with actually are included in this theory, because if we start with a Riemannian manifold with boundary, and uh, such that, so here we have the volume form, here we have the surface measure, and in particular, if we have a cap, uh, a k, a little k, which is uh, uh, defined on the interior of the manifold, and uh, it provides a lower bound on the Ricci curvature of the, uh, of the open manifold, 
And we have also uh, another function L, which is defined on the boundary. And this is a, uh, provides a lower bound on the second fundamental form uh, of the boundary. Then this uh, kappa, which is defined in this way, so we have the multiplication of this uh, k uh, times the volume measure, plus uh, we have the part of the boundary multiplied with the, uh, the measure on the boundary. This is, is a the distribution, which is quasi-local, and is also moderate. And moreover, uh, the, the, the Richless space is a uh, tame uh, by k. So yeah, if this is moderate, then the Dirichlet space is tamed by this uh, kappa. And this is uh, what I wanted to say, and I thank you for your attention. Um, thank you for the talk. Uh, what I wanted to know if, if there was a Lagrangian formulation of this um, lower so bound, uh, <laughs> and also what what are the consequences in terms of uh, function inequalities of of, of such uh, such a bound? Yeah, we have a lot of functional inequalities. Indeed, <laughs> we were able to to generalize the, the main ones. Um, plus, we have also some results in the case in which you have the reflection on the boundary of the manifold. So, uh, and yeah, it's, uh, yeah. but there are, let's say, the, the Poincaré, the local Poincaré, the reverse Poincaré, they are all holding true. Okay, thank there you. There is also, an, let's say, uh, there are two formulations, like a L1 and L2 formulation, and we have also the self-improvement of the, uh, of the condition, so. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I just had one like, extremely pedantic question from earlier in the talk. Yeah. So in your setup for what is the definition of the Dirichlet space? Yes. Um, you you want the underlying space to actually be a topological losing space rather than Polish. Yes. And it is is and this is really not standard, right? For the um, like a RCD space theory, like if you really want to work with spaces that are not have no metric structure underneath. Uh, is this standard for the Dirichlet form literature to work in this setting? Or? Once you have a Dirichlet form, you have also a way to introduce an intrinsic distance. But if it's if it's a losing space, then it's not metrizable in such a way that you had the the metric is then compatible with the topology, right? Mm -hmm. So how do you so but this, so, you, so you get an intrinsic distance, but then it is not not um, a topological distance. That's really what happens. Honestly, like with the topology, we don't see it so much. I mean, we don't see I the see. topology. It's uh, everything is coming really from the form, right? So when uh, you speak about uh, open sets, it's quasi open sets, right? So at the end, you we don't really need the topology. It's really like uh, every all the results are coming from the fact that you have a Dirichlet form. I see. But then why why do you need the lucidity to set up the Dirichlet form machinery? Yeah, it's it's something that typ yeah indeed typically is uh, taking like. Uh, the losing space is uh, needed to define the Dirichlet form, but it's, uh, it's, uh, it seems to me that it's the standard setting okay. where the okay. Dirichlet uh, space is defined, but okay. it's uh, nothing which is uh, actually in came in coming into play. Okay, okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. So I was saying, I, in order to focalize the problem, I recall the very classical isoperimetric uh, inequality in RD. So given uh, some uh, uh, set in RD, the perimeter uh, of this set is bounded from below uh, by D times omega D to the one over D times uh, its uh, Leber measure to the power D minus one over D. And moreover, this um, inequality is uh, well known to be rigid. And this means uh, that uh, uh, it's saturated if and only if the, the set coincides uh, with a ball and uh, the radius of uh, that ball is what one expects, that is the measure of the set uh, over omega d to the power 1 over d. Our, wor our wor work 
uh, dealt with uh, this uh, second part of uh, the statement. So the plan of this uh, short talk is uh, to uh, briefly uh, recall what is known in the, the compact setting and then uh, present uh, the, the novel uh, uh, non-compact case. So the world that we uh, live in is uh, the non-smooth world. Uh, so we, uh, we work with metric measure spaces. We work uh, with uh, CDK, K, CDKN spaces introduced by Schurm and uh, Lot Villani. Uh, the CDKN condition is a condition that bounds uh, the Ricci curvature from, uh, uh, from below and, uh, the, uh, and the dimension for, for, from above. I, I don't recall uh, the, the definition because it was uh, already stated by, by uh, a few speakers uh, in this conference. I just rec uh, recall that uh, if uh, we have a Riemannian manifold, uh, we satisfy the CD uh, KN condition if and only if the rich curvature is bounded from below by K and the dimension is smaller than N. The CD KN, uh, KN condition um, does not exclude the, uh, non Riemannian structures. For example, RD with any norm and the Lebesgue measure is a CD 0N uh, space for any norm. However, the RCD condition uh, was introduced to exclude uh, those kind of uh, finster uh, structures. So, uh, regarding the compact uh, setting, uh, the compact setting is given by the CDK uh, and spaces with K strictly positive. Without a loss of generality, we can assume that K is equal to N minus one. And uh, we can also assume, uh, without a loss of generality, that the measure is a probability measure. So in order to state uh, uh, the isoperimetric inequality, we have to describe the, uh, the so-called isoperimetric profile. Uh, it is defined in this way. The geometric meaning uh, of this function is given by this. Uh, fix uh, some uh, v between uh, 0 and 1. Take uh, as, uh, an n-dimensional sphere. Take a, a spherical cap in uh, the sphere such that uh, the measure of uh, this spherical, the ratio between the measure of uh, the spherical cap and the measure of the sphere is extracted V, compute the perimeter, and then uh, define the supermetric profile as the perimeter of this, uh, uh, of, of, uh, this uh, uh, spherical cap divided by the measure of the sphere. Uh, so, uh, an isoperimetric uh, the isoperimetric uh, inequality for uh, this kind of spaces was, uh, was given by Cavalletti and Mondino. They proved that uh, if XDM is an essentially non branching CDN minus one in space, then for any Borel set, the perimeter of E is bounded from below by the isoperimetric uh, profile computed, uh, computed at the, the measure of the set. Uh, in, the same, uh, in the same paper, they also proved uh, that uh, this result is uh, rigid. Uh, that is, uh, if uh, the space is RCDN minus 1N, uh, if uh, we have uh, some set E such that is, the measure is not uh, at the end point 0 and 1, if uh, the isoperimetric inequality is uh, saturated, then uh, the space is a spherical suspension. Uh, let me try to explain what is a spherical suspension. Uh, it means that uh, it can, uh, there are spherical coordinates in, uh, in the space. So uh, we can uh, split the space in uh, uh, the interval 0 pi, that uh, has the meaning of uh, collatitude, and uh, some uh, RCD n minus 2 n minus 1 space. In spherical, uh, so uh, we mid, we, meaning that we are in spherical coordinates means that we can describe the speed of a curve uh, in uh, these coordinates. And uh, the speed of a curve is uh, indeed the square speed uh, of the collatitude plus the square speed of, uh, let's call it the longitude. The, the speed of the longitude is uh, uh, weighted by the sinus of the collatitude, and then we take the square root. It's not mm, no, it's not. 
So, uh, and we, uh, we also have, uh, uh, we also have uh, the measure in, uh, in uh, spherical coordinates. That means that uh, the measure of the space can be viewed as the product of the Lebesgue measure of the interval zero pi times uh, uh, the measure uh, of, of the space y, and then a weight given by the sinus uh, to the power n minus one times uh, n minus one of, of the collatitude, and this uh, weight plays a role of a uh, Jacobian determinant. So uh, we go to the to the non-compact case, and we consider C D zero and space k is equal to zero. Uh, of course, uh, uh, C D zero and spaces can uh, actually collapse. We can take spheres uh, that are smaller and smaller, and then uh, an isoperimetric uh, inequality is uh, the only is not on the only possible isoperimetric inequality is, uh, is the trivial. The perimeter is uh, non-negative. So in order to have uh, and non-trivial uh, isoperimetric inequality, we have uh, some condition then that uh, counterbalance the CD uh, zero and uh, condition, and it is the so-called Euclidean volume of condition. What I mean, fix some uh, point X, take the ball of radius R uh, centering that point, compute uh, the measure of this ball, divide by omega n to the power R over n, R to the n, divide by omega n times r to the n, and then compute the limit for r that goes to the infinity. This limit must exist by bishop rom of inequality, and if it is strictly positive, we say that the space has Euclidean volume growth, and we call the limit asymptotic volume ratio. Sorry? Asymptotic volume ratio. So, uh, Balog and uh, Cristalli, uh, proved an isoperimetric uh, inequality for this uh, kind of spaces. They take uh, CD zero n spaces with Euclidean volume growth. If uh, for any Borel subset, if that the perimeter of the set is bounded from below by n times uh, omega n times the asymptotic volume ratio, uh, volume ratio to the power one over n, times the measure to the, the power n minus one over, over n. Uh, let me point out that uh, if we speci specialize this, uh, this, uh, this theorem to the Euclidean, uh, the standard Euclidean space, uh, the asymptotic volume ratio is one, and we call it the very classical isoperimetric uh, inequality. So regarding uh, the rigidity, there is a, uh, 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 a previous result given by Antonello, Antonelli, Pasqualetto, Pozzetta, and Semola uh, in, a, in a slightly different set, in, a, in this setting. They considered uh, non-collapsed RCD uh, zero and spaces. Non-collapsed means that the, the, they, choose, uh, they choose the as a reference measure the Hausdorff, uh, the n-dimensional Hausdorff measure, and they take space with Euclidean volume growth. They assume that uh, there exists uh, a Borel set with positive finite measures saturating the isoperimetric inequality. In this case, uh, they have uh, two kinds of rigidity. Uh, first, they have the rigidity uh, of the set E. They prove that uh, E is uh, a ball, is a ball. And they also prove uh, that uh, the space uh, is a cone. Uh, a cone is, uh, in some sense, uh, similar to a spherical suspension. In this case, uh, uh, the coordinates that we have are uh, the, the radial component and uh, the tangential component. Uh, y uh, is uh, a suitable RCD n minus 2 n minus 1 space. And the, uh, if we want to describe the speed of a curve in these coordinates, it turns out that uh, the speed is given by uh, the, the square speed of uh, the radial component plus the square speed uh, of, uh, the, of the tangential component times uh, the radial component, everything squared. And uh, the reference measure, oops, and the reference measure uh, is given by the Lebesgue measure on the half line times uh, the measure of the space y, 
and the weight the, that uh, we put is uh, the radial component to the power n minus one. And yes, okay. So we come to uh, our theorem. Uh, the setting that we have uh, is uh, the setting of essentially non-branching uh, CD zero n spaces uh, with Euclidean volume growth. And they assume that there, uh, there exists a bounded Borel set with positive measure uh, saturating the isoperimetric inequality. Uh, well, first of all, we, uh, we have the rigidity of, uh, of the set. We have proved that uh, E is a ball and the radius of the ball uh, is what one expects, that is the measure of V over omega n times the asymptotic volume ratio to the power one over n. Uh, we don't have a rigidity of uh, the distance. However, we have a rigidity of, uh, uh, of the measure. Um, we say that uh, we, have, uh, uh, we can explicitly describe the disintegration with, res with respect to the function minus the distance uh, from, uh, from the center of the, of the set. Let me explain uh, what I mean. Uh, fix some alpha in the boundary uh, of, uh, of our set. And then uh, join uh, the center of the wall uh, to alpha and alpha with a geodesic and extend this uh, geodesic to the infinity. So we proved that we can do this, we can extend this geodesic to the infinity for almost every alpha. Uh, and then uh, on this ray, uh, we put uh, uh, a measure which is absolutely continuous uh, with respect to uh, the one-dimensional Hausdorff measure, and the weight in uh, the unitary speed uh, parameterization is given by n omega n times the asymptotic volume ratio times uh, uh, t to the power n minus one. Um, let me comment a bit uh, the hypothesis of this theorem. So uh, we have the essentially non-branching hypothesis. Uh, this is just uh, an hypothesis to avoid uh, pathologies uh, such that, for example, uh, the one norm or the infinity norm uh, in the Euclidean space uh, for, to avoid possibly branching uh, of the geodesics. And uh, uh, a weakness of this result is unfortunately is that we uh, require the, the set to be bounded, but uh, um, uh, we can hope that uh, one can prove independently that uh, an isoperimetric set is uh, indeed bounded. Okay, so we can uh, specialize this result to uh, the setting of uh, RCD zero n spaces. We can apply uh, Gilles and De Filippi's uh, theorem from volume cone to metric cone, and we prove that uh, the space is uh, indeed a cone also in the metric sense. So uh, let me point out that uh, this corollary is not just uh, a restatement of uh, Antonelli's theorem, it's uh, indeed a real improvement because uh, here the measure is not uh, the, uh, the house, is not, in general it's not uh, the house of measure, it can be any measure indeed. Uh, yes. And uh, this theorem has uh, some, uh, some applications. Uh, in the application in, uh, to, the, uh, to the problem of the isoperimetric, uh, isoperimetric problem uh, in, uh, in Euclidean cones. So take sigma to be an open convex uh, cone in uh, the Euclidean space and take uh, W as uh, some weight. We take H as uh, a gauge uh, that is uh, a, a convex uh, positively one homogeneous function. Uh, we define uh, the weighted anisotropic perimeter of uh, some regular set E with this formula. That is, we integrate uh, over the boundary of E intersection sigma of uh, the gauge computed at the external uh, normal vector. We multiply by the, uh, by the weight and when we integrate with respect to the D minus one uh, Hausdorff measure. An isoperimetric inequality for uh, this kind of perimeter was given uh, by Cabrero, Luton, and Serra. Uh, they assumed uh, 
W to be alpha homogeneous and uh, uh, W to the one uh, over alpha uh, to be concave. Uh, let me point out that, sorry, uh, that uh, uh, this first hypothesis uh, that the alpha homogeneity uh, reminds uh, the, the hypothesis uh, of uh, having asymptotic volume, uh, volume uh, ratio, to have an asymptotic uh, volume ratio, and uh, W to the power one of alpha to be concave reminds uh, the CD zero n uh, uh, condition. So they give a bound from below of uh, the perimeter. Uh, so uh, the, the perimeter scales uh, with power. Uh, if we scale a set, the perimeter scales with power d plus alpha minus one, because w is alpha homogeneous and the Hausdorff measure is uh, d minus one uh, homogeneous. The weighted uh, measure scales with uh, power d plus alpha. So if we uh, divide the perimeter by the measure, uh, uh, the measure of the set, uh, to, to, uh, to this power, we obtain a zero homogeneous uh, function, and we bound from below by uh, this quantity computed uh, with uh, E equal to W, and W is the Wolf shape associated to H. So, is this uh, inequality rigid? Uh, let me recall uh, a few uh, known results for, uh, uh, for the rigidity of uh, this isoperimetric problem. The first uh, is given by Lyon and uh, Pacella, and actually it predates uh, the, uh, the result by Cabrera, Sonton, and Serra because uh, they consider the, the uh, unweighted uh, setting with uh, uh, H uh, to be the, Euclid the standard Euclidean uh, norm. Then there is a, a result by Di Piero, Poggesi, and Valdinoci. They solve the, pro the unweighted problem with uh, any possible uh, gauge. Cinti, Glaudo, Pratelli, Rosatone, and Serra solve the, the problem, solve the weighted problem, but uh, in uh, the isotropic, uh, isotropic setting. So uh, we came, came to our result. Uh, we assumed H to be uh, a norm. Uh, a norm means the, that uh, is a gauge that is symmetric uh, with a strictly convex, uh, uh, with a strictly con the ball and the balls of the norm are strictly convex. Um, the fact that the balls are strictly convex means that the space is uh, non-branching, and so uh, we can apply uh, the, the result. And uh, we prove that if the isoperimetric inequality is saturated, uh, then E is a rescaled wolf shape. Okay, so uh, before uh, concluding, le let me uh, point out that uh, right now I'm uh, working, uh, uh, I have actually proved that uh, this hypothesis of um, uh, symmetry can, uh, can be uh, lift. Uh, can be lift, and uh, yes, I'm preparing, preparing uh, the paper, and uh, it will be uh, it will be published uh, on Archive soon. And uh, I thank you for your attention. So thank you. Are there questions, comments? In case, um, um, okay, so you studied the non-negative Ricci. If instead you have a negative lower bound uh, Ricci, and instead of asking uh, uh, Euclidean volume growth, uh, you ask some kind of hyperbolic volume growth. I have no, uh, no idea. Okay. <laughs> 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 More questions? Okay, so I think uh, we are done. Uh, let's thank uh, uh, Menini again.
And uh, I remind to you that uh, tomorrow we will be in Aladini, not here. Please don't come here. <laughs> and go to Aladini. <laughs>